Welcome to The Conversation. I'm Heil Russell. And I'm Cameron Regal. And Cameron, Happy New Year. It's it's still perfectly fine to say Happy New Year because we haven't had an episode yet in 2021. So Happy New so, Year, Cameron. So New Year, Heil, New Year. Yeah, well, okay. So <laughs> I, I, I wanted to address this because... Up until this point, the conversation's seasons uh, have been structured perfectly within the chunk of time that is the uh, the, the calendar uh, that we follow. So season one was in 2013, uh, season two was in 2014, and season eight was in 2020, but of course it's now 2021, so what's going on here? Well, when we were... I, I think like rounding down the last episode we did, I realized we're not going to finish this season in time for the, the arbitrary flipping over of the calendar. And it, it's a calendar I wanted to flip over to, not just because I was done with 2020, but because I have this lovely new Donkey Kong calendar, official Donkey Kong calendar for the year 2021. So I was like, well, you know what? Honestly, 2020 is going to continue basically unofficially for, oh, I don't know, 20 days or so into January. I, that's just an arbitrary number I've pulled out of my ass. There's no political undertones there. And as this year has gone on so far, as we've seen, it's basically still 2020. So the conversation season eight will conclude on January 20th. As will many other things. And then uh, season nine will begin at some point in uh, February. But, um, yeah, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna shoot for the, the end of the season to be on January 20th. And that is when we will have our uh, New Year's episode where we will look forward to the year ahead. That is 2021, the 40th anniversary of Donkey Kong, by the way. And there might be some, relevant things to look forward to there so that's that's what's happening with the conversation so we got this episode then it's immediately going to be followed by the stop and swap retrospective uh with steve from off of rare gamer and then we'll we'll wrap it up with a, a capper episode as we always do so happy new year still season eight eh, still essentially 2020 anyway uh we also, I, I, I want to address something because I like to get some corrections out of the way at the, the beginning of the episode. So when we we're talking about Glitter Gulch Mine last time, we referred to Dilberta as a mole. And we got a lot of pushback like during the recording, but even after people were coming up to me on the street. And I was like, six feet, keep six feet away from me. But they were screaming that, that, no, obviously Dilberta is a mouse or Dilberta is a rat or Dilberta is some sort of other muskrat. I don't know. But uh, the, the possibility I was thrown that shocked me was gopher. That never occurred to me, even though it's incredibly obvious that should have been a choice. Yeah, it, it's it's funny because I think the hard hat combo it's such a ubiquitous design choice for a cartoon mole where um so much so we have two of them in the DKU alone other than Dilberta that I immediately think of hard hat and mole Meyer max right which you, you know there might be there's some speculation that mole, the mole miners from Donkey Kong Country Returns were in fact inspired by hard hat uh, when retro played Donkey Kong Land but then you also have that Kirby game that was in development around the mid nineties and the, <laughs> there was like some confusion about a mole character in that with hard hat. I, it's a whole thing. I, I but um, yeah, Dilberta, not a mole because that would make no sense considering that bottles and his whole family 
are such central components to this series. So uh, I apologize we even had the thought, and we had that thought for 20 years. <laughs> Okay, I've, I feel good. I feel good that that's off my chest, uh, that, that controversy. That's been weighing me down over the holidays. So Cameron, this is it. This is the last part of the Banjo Tooie spotlight, and we will be discussing the final four worlds, as well as Cauldron Keep, which is not really a world. I mean, it is, but it, it isn't. Um, it's sort of like the, um, those worlds, like the flying croc in, in Donkey Kong games where it's like, yeah, it's a world, but it's it just kind of uh, gussied up boss, final boss area. So let's start right in with Terry Dactylan, the fifth world of Banjo-Tooie. So this is the prehistoric world. And, you know, this, this is one of those things, one of those areas that was kind of alluded to in the original Banjo-Kazooie, one of the um, randomized dialogue things that can pop up with Mumbo in that game is that he's going to surprise you with his T-Rex spell, and then he decides not to do it because it's too good for this game. He'll save it for the sequel, but, uh, and, you know, that's just one of the things that can, like, pop up. I think just by complete randomization. I don't know like what the actual parameters are, like one out of every however many times you visit him. But uh, it, it was always a it was a big treat when you got to see it, especially when you were hunting Banjo Kazooie for uh, stop and swap clues. And it's like, well, is, is that part of it? But uh, they they paid it off here with Pterodactyl, and we did get a T Rex spell administered by Humba, not Mumbo. But they uh, also hung an entire world on it, a world full of dinosaurs and cavemen, which, not historically accurate, but it's not like they're time-traveling to, like, uh, the time of dinosaurs here. It's not a Flintstones-level anachronism. It's set in the present day, and it just happens to have all of these prehistoric elements to it. We'll get into it, but I think this world hangs on that transformation in more ways than one. <laughs> oh, real! You just launched right into it, Cameron. I, I thought oh, I no, was I didn't be actually first. mean that innuendo. I was alluding to something else, but uh, now that you <laughs> mention it, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. So it was just uh, we're gonna make, be making a lot of Freudian slips here as, as we as we try to uh, avert our eyes from the the big. Um, <laughs> The big uh, hanging, um, I was going to say elephant in the room, but that just brings to mind a trunk. And uh, anyway, so <laughs> uh, Pterodactyl Land, you know, I think this might be in a running. I think Jolly Rogers Lagoon, at least the actual town, is my favorite area in the game. But I think Pterodactyl Land, weirdly, is in a running for my favorite world. And I think it's because, especially in a back half of the game. I, I think it, it's up there for me. I like the characters. I like the, the interactions you have with the characters. I like that we have this little like, ecosystem on the Isle of Hags that is just such a like throwback. It completely removed from the rest of the island culture, although as we've seen, characters from Pterodactyl Land do interact with the broader Isle of Hags. But I like that they have just their own thing and their own customs and their own culture going on here. Um, and I, I, I know I've seen complaints that Pterodactyl Land is it's too big and wide and expansive and there's not enough in it to justify it. But I see that I complain about a lot of Banjo-Tooie's worlds and Ukulele's worlds. And I, I never really click with that criticism because I don't personally see it so much. But, um, no, Pterodactyl Land so, is great. So, it's more of a mixed bag for me, and it's kind of a mixed bag for the reason that you kind of stated there, which is, it is a very large world, and what I was alluding to earlier, that it hangs on that T-Rex transformation, I kind of suspect the reason that Pterodactyl Land is as massive as it is, is to accommodate the daddy T-Rex transformation that you get. Yeah. Um, yeah, and kind of as to. a result, I think there's a lot of ground you need to cover 
doing simple tasks as Banjo-Kazooie and Mumbo that I take much longer than they would if the world were built not needing to account for that transformation. So, to a, to a degree, I think Pterodactyl Land is the point in the game where I start to run out of steam a little bit if I'm, like, doing a non-stop playthrough of it. Mm -hmm. But, all that said, um, even though I think the layout is a little exhausting, the actual world building is a ton of fun. And, like, all of the characters, this little sort of, as you said, off in the corner part of the Isle of Hags, um, insofar as it can be, because everything is interconnected in TUI. Um, yeah. But also just, as, as spread out as everything is... There are a ton of cool set piece moments in Pterodactyl Land, and almost all of them involve dinosaurs themselves. Yeah, I, I think like the size works for me because it kind of makes sense for me to like drop. If you're gonna drop Banjo and Kazooie into this domain of dinos, not a dino domain, uh, Banjo Banjo already they, went they could that, use a car but... to get around it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. We sh we should send that to Rare. Hey, what if what if Banjo and Kazooie got around with cars and vehicles? Think about that. Um, it <laughs> it makes sense to me, like that it would just kind of completely dwarf Banjo and Kazooie. Like it would be so massive that they would just feel almost inconsequential in this landscape. Uh, like that, that's the sense I got when I played it back in 2000, and that's the sense I, I still have of it. And it can be a little exhausting at times, but I think that exhausting nature serves it well. It, it, it serves to kind of sell the area that it is. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I like that we have all of these dinosaurs, some friendly, some very stereotypical, you know, dinosaurs attacking, but, um, I also like that you have these three cavemen cultures and and societies that are sort of uh, warring with one another. That is pretty uh, surprising. You get three distinct varieties of cavemen as opposed to just like the one token caveman species. Like, like even Bad Fur Day did that. Well, I, I was going to bring up Bad Fur Day because it's interesting to me. In in the course of Four months, uh, Rare had two games with four caveman tribes. <laughs> and and so in Banjo Tooie, Pterodactyl Land, we had the Oogle Boogles, the Unga Bungas, and the Rocknut tribe. But then in uh, Bad Fur Day, in, in that prehistoric region of Conker's Island, we had the Ooga Boogas, not to be confused with the Unga Bungas. And I wonder how much back and forth there was between the Tui team and the Bad Fur Day team. It's like, we got these cavemen in both games. Who's going to get the N in, in the name? Because uh, it's, it's like maybe Chris Siever and crew had also stumbled upon the name Unga Bungas. Or maybe the males I mean they both team. sound a little bit untoward in like a plausibly deniable way <laughs> yeah I suppose yeah but I just have to want like they, they had to make sure that they had distinct names so somebody had to go with Oonga Boonga and the other had to go with Ooga Booga <laughs> not to be confused with Oogle Boogle which was also in Tui uh yeah I, I like that you you've got very few human or like humanoid human ancestor characters in in the Banjo series. There's a uh, Melanie at the end of Banjo Kazooie. I guess arguably you know Grunty and her whole family are are human. But uh, then you've got Humba, and, and that's basically it. Saberman, yeah. which we'll talk about here so in a these, bit. But these cavemen are like stylized to the point that they don't. They look like human on the very periphery of it. Like I'd say the Oogle Boogles look the most like like a human, and it's like they're like the Fred they're like the Fred Flintstone model of caveman is what they are. Yeah, yeah, they, they got very cartoony proportions, it's similar to kind of Mario, you know, stocky and you know bulbous uh, facial features. But um, it, it, it's interesting to me that you know this is like really the first time we see 
humans or humanoid ancestors interacting with each other, and they're just a complete mess. They're at war with one another over petty little differences, and it's just, it's, it's, I don't know, it, it's a very resonant thing, uh, after the last week or so we, we've had here in this here in the U.S., it's like yeah, yeah, it's something. Yeah, the pet, I think the petty differences are something like uh, the Ungabungas want the cave, the Ugobugus want to share it, and therefore the Ugobugus are the enemy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the Ugobugus are the ones who are freezing, right? They're they're like they're they're freezing and hungry. They're freezing and hungry, right? So they're 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 being kind of. Um, put down by the Oonga Boongas. And then the Rock Nuts, they're really just kind of off on their own. Um, they're, they're more of a... like they're, There's less known about their political nature, and it's just more... There are obstacles that you need to overcome in order to get a Jiggy. Yeah, essentially you have to figure out how to pierce their Yeah, I'm not armor. really sure what their allegiance is supposed to be. They just seem... Their whole deal is, like, you can't beat us. That's, that's yeah. really... <laughs> But I like I like the idea too that uh, well, we'll talk about where the dinosaurs came from because in, in about two years on from Banjo Tooie's release there there is a possible origin point for all of the dinosaurs in these games Diddy Kong Racing Banjo Tooie and Conker's Bad Fur Day but I I like that you know you could have had these throwback cavemen cultures that like. Well, like the the modern Homo sapien developed and it kind of you know became the humans, uh, the human culture of of today. It, on the Isle of Hags, there were these these dead end evolutionary branches that somehow hung on to the uh, the 21st century. And <laughs> I don't know, they're still like they haven't advanced at all. They're still living in caves. Uh, at the most, the, like the most advancement they've c- had is bumming hamburgers from the nearby that's, amusement that's park. That's the thing. Like they, they don't seem that adv- terribly advanced, but they know what junk food is and to ask for it. <laughs> right. It's, it's like they're just like they, they're they're happy with their lives, but they're they're also happy to kind of. Uh, get what trickles down from the world, the modern world around them, which in this case, it's a modern world run by even, witches and You even animals. see like a, a weird like trickle between of ana- anachronistic societies where in one of the Ungabungas steals the precious relic thingy from, from uh, Chief Blotizen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's what makes the Isla Hags interesting to me, right, as a location. Because, you know, we talked about this earlier in the Spotlight series, but how it's, you know, ostensibly run by the Winky Bunions, but it, it's only, it's not really like this evil empire. Like, on the margins of the Isla Hags, you have all of these cultures and societies that are just kind of left to do their own thing. Uh, like I said, it's a, it's kind of a libertarian paradise and all of the horrors that that would actually bring about. <laughs> but, um, I, th- I, I, I like that we have these shitty cavemen. Well, the, the Ungas are really the shitty ones. You're supposed to sympathize a little bit with the Oogle Boogles. Um, but I, at least from what I gather, at least I did personally, I'm not here to tell you what to think people. I, I think you're meant to. I mean, they're the ones starving. <laughs> And yeah. Dying from lack of heat and chomping their own arms off. <laughs> this is also where I really feel like, you know, because Banjo and Kazooie have to help all of these people in every single world throughout, you know, all the games that they appear in. And, and I feel like here I really am making a difference through their actions. Like, cause, you know, sometimes it's stupid shit. Like, Oh, I've lost my treasure that's right beneath my feet. Oh, I've choked on a jiggy. Oh, oh, help me, help me. And here it's like, no, there's like cultural warfare going on. Maybe you, yeah, it, it's, it's them actually kind of providing like rescue, like UN humanitarian aid to the Oogle Boogles. Uh, <laughs> I like that. You also help out. Uh, Scrotty, and apologies for these names, by the way. I didn't come up with these names. 
Rare came up with these names. The Banjo Tui team came up I with these names. I mix up these names all the time. I can't. Rem- I can never remember who is who. I had to look this up. I I am a bad DKU fan in that I had to look it up. And and honestly, like this is this episode in particular is why I was so worried about doing a Banjo Tui spotlight because I knew the back half of Banjo Tui would be hard for me to talk about in very specific detail just because this is where the game for me gets convoluted it gets so mixed up i i even confuse i think this is the single most convoluted jiggy in the game what we're about to discuss yeah it, it probably is but i like my, my thing with the back half of two e is i forget that Hailfire Peaks is the seventh world. I feel like it's the fifth world. I always like put it earlier in the game in my head, and I'm like, "What? Wait, Hailfire Peaks was the seventh world? That doesn't seem right. That's way too late for Hailfire Peaks." Yeah, it does, it certainly, it doesn't feel like the second to last. It's right. Like uh, Grunny Industries, all, to me, always probably feels because like everything the is so muddled together and interconnected, back and forth. Yeah. That you, unless a world is particular, like Cloud Cuckoo Land, I think is at least off in the distance enough that you earmark it. Yeah, that's that's the last one, but sure. everything else. Sure. Yeah, um, anyway, yeah, the the, uh, the, one, the Jiggy you're referring to and that I was referring to was Scrotty and her kids. Uh, her, her three kids, this is, this is similar a little bit to helping out Mrs. Boggy in Witchy World, uh, finding... Um, groggy, soggy, and moggy, but with, with Scrotty and her kids, it's not just a case of bad parenting. It is actually, they've, well, two of them have real problems. The third, I don't know how much of a problem it is, rather than Scrotty kind of, um, putting aspirations on her child. But, um, you've got, uh, Scrut, who we, who we mentioned is the, Dino in Witchy World's uh, Cave of Horrors, Cavern of Horrors, uh, that is imprisoned, and you have to free free her, and then... Um, Who, if I remember right, uh, got to Witchy World by stealing money from Scrotty's purse. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> but, uh, and, and then you have to get 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 uh, Scrut back to Pterodactyl Land, which involves... Uh, Chuffy the train and um, uh, Chuffy actually comes into play quite a bit here. Um, but uh, then you've got Scrat, who is the sick one, and you have to take to uh, like to the overworld on Chuffy, if, if memory serves me right, so Mumbo can heal them. Uh, using a healing spell at the nearby mumbo pad and like that 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 to me is like one of the best things banjo and kazooie have done when they're helping out people is they're they're healing the sick now or at least getting their friend to heal the sick but arranging it so it can happen i I like mumbo being a literal doctor for the purposes of that yes yeah like like, they they, and they do make the witch doctor any doctor joke yeah yeah I, you know mumbo that that's a side of him you don't really get to see often because you know it's he's all about the the funny transformations but he is a, a shaman a, a witch doctor in some culture so yeah make him a, a doctor literally here and then you got scrit who scrit's only problem is scrit is small and all the other dinos laugh at him and so Scrotty wishes Scrit was larger. And so uh, you you have to use magic to make Scrit it, grow. It's it's the most easily uh, it, it's weird that these are kind of the ease with which these problems are um, remedied is in reverse order to how easily they'd be remedied in reality. Yeah. In that <laughs> you can make a Scrit larger by just uh, sending Mumbo in in that world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's... But, you know, I, I, I like that this mixes and combines so many characters and abilities 
and mechanics. Like you, you have to use Chuffy, the tr- the overworld train, the this this bridge between worlds in Banjo Tooie uh, to to help out. You've got to use Mumbo. You've got to use Banjo's uh, taxi pack. Uh, you know, going solo with Banjo and, and using his empty backpack to haul around other characters. It, it's a nice blending of abilities, which by this point in the game, you know, you should be getting well familiar with. And it's, um, it's nice, you know, like I, I know I said that Mumbo and his abilities, they're kind of, it's kind of just window dressing a little bit. Um, a lot of like Mumbo's role in this game is just it feels padding and just we we want Mumbo to be playable sort of, but it's it, it's all really just get him to a pad it, or set up a s- series of events. It's really so just the act of getting him where he needs to go is kind of underwhelming, but the spectacle once you get him there is generally a lot of fun. Yeah, and 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 here I feel like all of those elements work well together it's it's a nice um it's a nice union of different things you have to do so i i I really enjoy like scrot even if i can never remember their names except scrotty uh i I really enjoy scrotty and her kids i remember her name because it sounds vaguely like something related to what we'll talk about later oh it definitely is definitely like like i said i apologize for these names but I didn't. I didn't come up with them. Um, I really like all the dinosaurs in Pterodactyl Land. Um, Chomposaurus, in particular, is is uh, a, a fun one because I. It's it's kind of got like a boss like intro where Chomposaurus just straight up eats I, Banjo and Kazooie. I think and Chomposaurus might be the most visually striking thing in the entire game. His intro. I remember. I remember seeing screenshots of it before the game came out and just being in awe of how Tui was looking. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, there, there's this enormous dinosaur. Like, it, it just, it seemed like such a radical leap forward from Banjo-Kazooie. And it made Banjo-Kazooie seem relatively modest in comparison. It's not not just the size, but that that drool is, yeah. the, is the main thing I remember. Just the, like, giant gaping mouth and all of the mass amounts of drool Chomposaurus uh, spews before he swallows you. And I I love just the visual of him swallowing them. It's it's just, it's so blunt. It's so like, oh, this happened. Banjo-Kazooie just got eaten Oh yeah, you're, you're meant to be really taken aback by this, but then it turns out, no, he, he kind of just wants you to sort out his stomach ulcers. Yeah, it's a little bit like <laughs> Clanker uh, in the first banjo kazooie where you just have to go inside this enormous creature and sort of uh tend to their medical needs from within um but i mean like i said it's it's memorable it's striking it was one of those pre-release um bits of info that came out that was mind-blowing at, uh, at the time and uh, uh but in the credit roll he gets to eat nunga bunga yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> which is which is gratifying too after we or saw the, the way the character the parade. I forget. <laughs> yeah, but, but the yeah, way we character. saw the ungas treating the oogles, it was it's, it's nice to see one of them get their comeuppance. Yeah. I I think it might be the one the same one who shit his pants. Oh well, then that's an extra little treat for <laughs> Chomposaurus. Just the little it's the the cream filling uh, inside the chocolate. Uh, we got Dippy, Dippy the dinosaur, who again, it's it's a, a striking visual of of Dippy, the very thirsty dinosaur, who uh, th- this is a nice little bit of like the worlds being connected. You can't solve Dippy's problem until you get to the last full world of the game, Cloud Cuckoo Land, and you drain the lake um, in Cloud Cuckoo Land, which then falls down to earth uh in, in pterodactyl land and then that solves dippy's problem right the entire jiggy is just a joke about expecting it to fall from the sky yeah yeah uh and then with there's a, with a these... very long payoff <laughs> yes uh but dippy and, and is visually very cool he's humongous all, all these dinosaurs i i but especially uh 
Chompasaurus and Dippy. They're they're really because it's it's I think it's hard to do a unique cartoon dinosaur um, look because we've seen it so many times. Especially when you've got to keep to an N64 level of polygons. Yeah, and and also this would be the same time that Rare, uh, another team at Rare, was doing Dinosaur Planet. So you know, oh you, yeah, you none of have... these dinosaurs look like anything in Dinosaur Planet. No, there there is. Well, we'll we'll discuss that a bit. But you know, there there is a little um, bit of crossover, perhaps. But they they all look unique from anything in Diddy Kong Racing or Conquer or Dinosaur Planet, which became Star Fox Adventures. So um, yeah, it's it's impressive but uh one dinosaur that i really can't comment much on its appearance is the stomp onodon because you only ever see its feet but as far as like sequences go um as, as far as like memorable bits from terry land this might take the cake. yeah if if i if it if champasaurus isn't the most visually striking moment in the game stomp onodon is and they're both in this world. Um, it's, especially it's, this this intro Stomp on a Dawn gets where you're not even sure what's coming when the music starts to play. Yeah, it's terrifying in in its own way. Um, you know, you've got the the stomping fields that you have to get across, and then Stomp on a Dawn is this huge dinosaur. You only see its foot come down, but you have to basically run for your life. Uh, to uh, the imprinted footprint to imprinted footprint to evade getting crushed by the Stomponodon. And this whole sequence, we would later learn, was actually uh, a version of it existed in the original Super Nintendo Dream, the, the Land of Giants version of Dream. We saw Edson running from a big giant dinosaur foot uh, very similar. Uh, so it's, it's just cool to see that the team reused that very early idea from several years back on a different console in this Banjo-Kazooie sequel. So uh, I, I do want to bring up, before we move on to the boss, the plausibility of this Diddy Kong Racing's Dino Domain and the Ooga Booga region in Conquer all being filled with refugees from Dinosaur Planet, a.k.a. Saria, in Star Fox Adventures. And you said, you know, all of these dinosaurs don't resemble the dinos in uh, Star Fox Adventures, and that's true, but something that's, uh, that's often overlooked is that, like, the tribes of Saria are not... They don't have a one-to-one like a uh, lineup with actual dinosaur species. So earthwalkers aren't just triceratops. They're also like there are many different dinosaurs within that um I I'm not a paleontologist, so I apologize. You just say but like that family like styracosaurs yeah. and Yes. Yeah. So and like so, you know, in Cloud Runners, wouldn't just be uh, pterodactyls or, or pterodons. They would be, you know, a lot of like the the non-dinosaur flying prehistoric creatures. And, and so, like, you, you could say, yeah, yeah, like the Scrotty and her kids are f- from the Earthwalker tribe, but you know, they're they're their own thing. Again, not a paleontologist. It was, it was one. I always thought dinosaurs were cool. You can squint and cool. pretend. I mean, it's. I say they don't look alike, but that's through the the lens of art direction. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Like if you needed to draw a bridge, um, if you if you needed to draw a bridge between the art styles of Diddy Kong Racing and Star Fox Adventures, um, Banjo Tooie's dinosaurs are about what you would get, where it's the cartoony proportions mixed with like the realistic texture texture depth and a bit more more detail yeah i I like that star fox adventures and then star fox assault weirdly opened up the avenue for tricky leading an exodus to earth to the rare archipelago 
where you had all of these refugees like fleeing Saria after the Aperoid invasion uh, could then settle on all of these islands. And that's why we have dinosaurs. Because you, you also see fossils in all of these Yeah, worlds, I was right? about Dino to say, it would make it a bit less dark that Pterodactyland also has perfectly preserved fossils um, yeah. everywhere. And also even... Like, you don't see too many Flintstone-y trappings in this world, um, which I, I think was another part of my problem with the layout of it, trying to find my way the first time around, because a lot of t- uh, Pterodactyl Land is sort of a Death Valley aesthetic. Um, mm-hmm. But um, one of the few touches of flintstone you see is uh, the Chuffy's train station is... Uh, the track is laid with bone. Yeah, yeah, oh, I, I, I really like that, yeah. Which, again, yeah, it gets a little dark if di- dinosaurs concurrently exist <laughs> on this, on this yeah. plane. But, you know, you saw the same thing in Dino Domain, and I'm pretty sure in the Ooga Booga chapter. And then, you know, in, on Donkey Kong Island, we, we've we not seen resurrected dinosaurs, or, or, like, living dinosaurs, but we have seen the reanimated fossils. So... I like maybe that. Maybe they just don't bury their dead because they just are conditioned to expect, well, they might get back up at some point. <laughs> no, but I like that all living dinosaurs in a rare archipelago are actually Saurian, and they're not descended from Earth's dinosaurs, which are, in fact, extinct. Um, so that that that's, like, my favorite little bit of fanon, which has been egged on by Rare a little bit in the intervening years. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm all for just acknowledging that as soft canon, that yeah, they're all Saurian, um, and Star Fox Adventures, which would come at the very end of their partnership with Nintendo, kind of provided the explanation for all of that when Tricky says he wants to explore the stars, and... It, It is an incredibly handy way to just wave away the fact that these creatures are all still alive, and also... One separated by various eras, yeah, prehistory yeah, or I all mean, around together. It, you know, it, it's it's cartoony Flintstones logic. It's like they're, but they're aliens. Would, it's okay. Yeah, I, I would argue there's more logic here than there is the Flintstones, where they had a Flintstones Christmas special, which I don't even I don't I don't understand how that works, but okay. Um, anyway, uh, Terry, uh, the the boss of pterodactyl land um and uh, probably as far as motivations go my favorite boss yeah i was gonna say as a character terry is easily the favorite well because not only do you fight terry oh you know it's a misunderstanding but it's a misunderstanding that makes sense and but then that opens up further quest with terry to to find his kids to find his eggs um and, and so basically, like, Terry becomes kind of like uh, Old King Cole. Terry becomes a character after the boss fight. It's not just you're going to fight this giant monster and defeat it. It's like, no, there's more to the story after that, which I really appreciate. Um, and really helps, like, make Terry a more memorable character, a more fleshed out character than um, somebody like... Oh, uh, I... Weldar. <laughs> so. Yeah. So apparently, what Terry's deal is, um, according to Jingling, he just had a messy divorce, or rather, his <laughs> wife left. Or well, I don't know if it's a divorce. It just says it, he just says his wife left him recently. Yeah. Um, left him with the kids, and he's pretty overprotective and not in the best state. And immediately before, sometime before Banjo and Kazooie show up. In his nest, the eggs have gone missing, so he's in a panic and immediately assumes Banjo and Kazooie stole them and wants to take take them out over it. It, it reminds me of Nimbo from Ukulele, which his his wife left him for a typhoon. Just <laughs> I, I I like when these characters have very like. Um, mundane domestic stories going on it, it really helps ground this absurd cartoon prehistoric it, world it's like it's, no, terry's just a guy he's just he's just a struggling single father going through a messy divorce this, this is Give genuinely me. my favorite 
thing in Banjo Tooie's world building and why I think it's my favorite in the series tonally is when you mix the fantastic with the mundane. And that's, I think, what Rare always has excelled at, especially like uh, Donkey Kong Country onward Rare. They, they really do a good job of making these, these stupid characters uh, feel like human, even when most of them are not, in fact, human. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Terry is, uh, you know, you, you fight him in his nest, and it's, you know, it's, I, I, you know, I, I think as far as boss fights go, it's more memorable for the character and the trappings after the fact than it is the boss fight, but, um, yeah, Terry's one of my favorite in, in the game. Yeah, I noticed, I think he also gets, um, in the course of solving his problem, you have to go around and hatch the eggs all over the place in Pterodactyl Land. It stands out to me. It stands out to me that he gets the like only joke that Kazooie kind of reacts negatively to, um, which is um the final child of Terry's you find. The conceit is Kazooie hatches it and it's too big to carry to make its way back to the nest. It can't fly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, Terry asks Kazooie, you, you could just hit it with one of those grenade eggs, couldn't you? <laughs> and, yeah, cause, Kazooie calls him heartless over it, not knowing that he's just joking, but, yeah, uh, Kazoo- Kazooie, uh, drawing the line at dead baby jokes. I, I like that it shows that a lot of Kazooie's darkness is really, like, bluster or just kind of a defense mechanism versus an actual like sociopathic well, it, nature. <laughs> she's fundamentally a good person, just not nice. She's not nice and I think she, it, it's just uh, a defense like I said defense mechanism. It's it's a shield she has to kind of protect herself. Um I I could you know that that would be a good With good cause series. considering everything she gets subjected to. Yeah, that would be games. a good conversation series would be uh putting characters like DKU characters on the therapy couch and psychoanalyzing them why they are the way they are. Uh, I might have, might have to put that in my notes, but um, yeah, I, I, I like that little bit because, you know, Kazooie was the one who was kind of making dead bottles jokes, but dead baby jokes. On the other hand, Kazooie's like eager, incredibly eager to tell his kids and wife that he had died. I fan wank that though as as Kazooie trying to process her own emotions over it and trying to put some psychological distance. It's like, oh, my poker buddy bottle died before me. I I I I can't deal with this right now, so I'm going to. It's basically me at funerals where I'm making jokes to myself um, to kind of keep from feeling anything too real. Um, uh, or, or me, like, uh, watching the n- recent current events on the news, and I'm just making jokes, trying to keep from actually uh, absorbing what I'm seeing. But, um, wow, I'm really sympathizing with Kazooie as of late. This is what 2020 has done to me. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the Humba transformation, the T-Rex transformation, and, and one of the most anticipated of the game for the aforementioned little mumbo... Uh, hidden, hidden piece of mumbo dialogue in the first game. Uh, I hear from a lot of fans, you know, that the the T Rex transformation transformation was disappointing, that it wasn't what they anticipated or dreamt of from the original Banjo Kazooie. But I don't see how you could really do it any better than the way they did it, and they did it both ways because because they give you initially the more disappointing version, the baby T Rex. But then they, they, they give you what you actually dreamt of. They give you the full adult T-Rex. Um, there's just less you can do with it for obvious reasons. Yeah, it's it's a matter of... for the, t, the Daddy T-Rex doesn't do a whole lot, but I don't think it really needed to do a whole lot other than exist and be cool. Um, yeah. Because I don't I mean, think realistically it has that much utility. It doesn't. Unless no, you, unless you want to make Pterodactyl Land even more obnoxiously large. <laughs> Look, I'm not a game designer. I I am a lore nerd. I like universe building. That that is my area of expertise. Okay. But I I think I, 
in practice, the T-Rex has exactly two practical uses. It's to stand on a big switch and roar so loud that it scares the Ungabunga into shitting himself and running away. Uh, and number three, it's cool. It, it, it's it's cool to control something so giant and massive and terrifying, and it ultimately fulfills a promise from Banjo-Kazooie, which, considering some of the promises they had to break, see the next episode for more on that, uh, at, at least they were able to pay this off. And, you know, it brings to mind comparisons to Mario Odyssey, because, uh, you know, controlling a T-Rex with Cappy drew a lot of comparisons to Banjo-Tooie um, at the time Odyssey came out. So, um, I don't really have anything to add to that other than, you know, it, it is, I think, one of the more iconic uh, elements of yeah, the series. To, to the point that when people were speculating, well, what would Banjo do in Smash Brothers if he ever got in... Like, Daddy T-Rex was probably the most common candidate I saw for, well, what would Banjo's final smash be? Yeah. Yeah. And and honestly, I think that that's one area where, like, fan hypotheses, fan fantasies kind of outpaced what was arguably the more iconic and simpler choice. And I think the Ginginator... Uh, was surprising I, and more apropos for yeah, what their final smash I'm ultimately did. glad with what they went with, haha, ultimately, because it squeezed, like, a lot more characters into the game because it got all the varieties of Jinjo and the Jinjinator. Yeah, and, you know, I, th- this is going on a tangent, but the Jinjinator was one of my f- favorite characters things about banjo kazooie's ending because you know you, it, it was our first glimpse of broader jinjo culture other than them as these rote one note collectibles uh in the worlds and i felt like the Jinjinator, there was so much more to learn about him and then he was just nowhere to be seen in later games and then when we got to see more jinjo culture it was via Jingling and Jinjo Village, and there's nothing about the Jinjinator. So to have the Jinjinator get that smash bump, that that kind of instant elevation to permanent iconic uh, status because of its uh, appearance in a Smash Brothers game, I'm perfectly pleased with that. Whereas uh, uh you know having Mumbo appear and or or Humba appear and transform Banjo into a T-Rex. Um, Which, it, given the way they retooled one. Final Smashes for Ultimate, you probably wouldn't even have that much control over. Right, right. And, you know, I, I think Final Smashes work better as set pieces rather than something you have to actually um, engage with. But um, I, uh, I, I also think that, you know, we got Mumbo still appearing uh, in the background of Spiral Mountain, and then we got the Ginginator. So I'm I'm much happier with that than those uh, fan dreams of years gone by. Cameron, let's talk about the penis because I don't see any way around it. <laughs> it's... Yeah, we've we can't dance around this forever. <laughs> um... No, there's a big phallic penis <laughs> that it's not even look we've had it confirmed to us it's a penis it's it's not like they it it's not so this is something i definitely didn't even notice playing the game the first time and only <laughs> like really came about when i'd see the overhead views of it that like dk vine had archived in screen caps <laughs> but the more that you it, it's one of those things like you can go playing the game without noticing it's there but once you do notice it's there, so many things line up in such a way that it's like... And I think by all accounts, like, this was a total accident. But oh, was it? Because I've, I've had it mentioned to me in private chat that... No, it, it was in... I think, for plausible deniability's sake, it's an accident. <laughs> uh, an but, accident in quotes. Yeah. Um, 
No, I don't know if the um but just so much circumstantial things line up just the <laughs> most mostly Circum- the circumstantial. Um, yeah, that's mostly that's the, a way to the it. rocks spurting out from it that you need to enlarge in order to cross the chasm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it it looks like a dripping dick. It it it's <sighs> you know I, I can say a lot uh, from the perspective of 2021 Heil, but year 2000 Heil, who still very much enjoyed a good juvenile uh, filthy thing hidden in something like this, uh, had no bad words to say about the pterodactyl land penis. I, I admired it. I looked up to it. It was my mentor. And... <laughs> Well, I've I've mostly outgrown such uh, crude, just like baseless forms of haha. Look what we can get away with in a game like this. Uh, kind kind of um, hidden jokes. Uh, it, it it was the perfect thing for young me. Uh, it was just like oh my! I, they got away with it. They got away with hiding a big old penis. In a Nintendo game. At the very least, I appreciate that there is absolutely zero comment on this in the game itself. Like, that is yeah. how you can go the entire way without realizing it's there. Yeah. And, you know, it. Well, it, it, I, I think it, you know... <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I've said so much about this over the years that I think that... It, it's kind of lost all meaning to me. It's just like, yeah, the, the pterodactyl land um, dangler. It's... <laughs> it, it sounds it like you have posters up uh, of it in, the, in like, Pikelet's police station. <laughs> the fact that I think they know that it, it, it's too far. The, the fact that we've had like official like no of course we didn't mean that and then in private wink wink uh i i think even they know it was a a bridge too far or rather it it was something (laughs) at the very least it does seem dubious of if this was an accident it is a little dubious nobody caught it in however many revisions there would have been between drawing the map and shipping the game yeah yeah i mean it (sighs) Yeah, <laughs> it just <laughs> it you know c- when when you compare it to all the other jokes in, in Banjo Tooie that are a bit shocking and risque, it's not surprising. It's it's not surprising, and they had a lot of land they had to fill with pterodactyl land, and I'm sure uh, some equivalent of cabin fever started to set in, and they were like. What if, what if it looked like this? And there we go. But it's for me, it is the drippage from it that is is really the the piece of resistance. It is the um, it, it is what takes it from filth to like all time greatest perversions in video games. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it 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 brought a lot of web traffic to early DK Vine, so I can never fully disown it. Um, for, for, for a while, while we were still making our name in the, the rare fan community, the, the DKU community, um, people found us from our... Oh, I think we had the first screenshot of it. Of, of D- the, DK the Vine was the original OnlyFans, but for Pterodactyl Land. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, it, on my grave, that will be one thing that uh, can be etched on there is w- was one of the two people who helped perpetuate the fact that there was a big old male organ in, in, uh, in this, in this, uh, in this banjo tui world. All right, let's talk about Grunny Industries, Cameron. And, Grunny Industries, appropriately enough, is an underwear factory, so we can cover up what we just talked about. Um, so, you know, we, t- we talked about Witchy World and how this team at 
rare. The the males, brothers, and and it's Chris Sutherland on down. They really seem to like this idea of a bad, a, a batty amusement park, right? Uh, a, an amusement park gone wrong. And another trope they seem to really like is the batty run factory which really serves them well with a lot of the envir- vi- environmental messages they, you know, put in their games about how, you know, unchecked industrialization, harming the environment, polluting, yeah. toxic waste. Uh, I mean, that was a big set piece of the original Donkey Kong yeah. Country. And then the, the DKC3 team really took that and, yeah. and developed it even more in DKC3. I- I do think this is the zenith of that concept because not only do we have this ultra pollutinous, dingy, grimy, disgusting factory, but we also learn what it manufactures, and there is no earthly way that it should be that pollutinous. Yeah, I mean that that's that's the joke that it's it's all of this waste, all of these resources, all, like this just ruinization of this natural pristine island because it's not just uh the area around grundy industries that they've wrecked you know they they're also polluting in the jolly rogers lagoon and and um it's it's all in service to make tidy whities and that that's the kind of absurd uh, thing that not only like serves the game well and serves Gruntilda and her taste well, because we know like she has a weird affinity for underwear from like Gruntilda clues, right? From from the last game, but it it I it also kind of helps with the odd world building of the Rare Archipelago because I mean, this is this also is, just like a stock like cartoon slapstick item, really is yeah. also adding to the joke. But considering that a rare character who would make their official video game debut one world later uh, in Hailfire Peaks is Mr. Pants, and Mr. Pants is an underwear designer, underwear manufacturer, underwear model, uh, game show host, international man of mystery, uh, probably a knight at this point, but just beloved... Uh, and just this, this weird, like, celebrity that everybody in the Rare Archipelago has this affinity for. The fact that we're, we see one of his chief competitors in Grunny Industries and their underpants. I like that in my head, I can imagine that there is just this, like, like we had the Cola war, Wars in the 80s, right, between Coke and Pepsi. Well, of course, in the DKU, we have the Underpants Wars. And that, that just seems appropriate. And that's the kind of, like, nonsense that is even carried forward today it's, in games like... It, it's Lately, an Underpants so. War, and we see the losing side of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's no way Mr. Pants would lose the Underpants War, so... Like, Grunty's uh, got power, but she, she's not that powerful. No. Grunty Industries, though... Uh, um, so, I th- I don't think I'm speaking out of line here, Cam. I don't hate Grunty Industries, because I don't hate anything about this game, except those damn googly eye Banjo-Kazooie cartridges. More on that next episode. But I don't hate anything about Banjo-Tooie, but I, I will say Grunty Industries... And I, I'm not alone here. Grunny Industries is my least favorite world in Banjo Tooie. And I think it's all down to the general dreariness of it. it it's supposed to be dreary. It's supposed to be um, just like morally draining and visually depressing. But I. I'm drawn to these games because of the way Rare like, celebrates nature and these natural worlds uh, that are like colorful and vibrant, and they're, they're environments I would want to visit, and Grunny Industries is just not that. And it's not supposed to be that, and that's fine, but that it is such a massive, massive world with floors and 
chambers and it's a it's it's just this maze upon a maze of rooms and corridors and tunnels and pipes and sludge and it's gray and it's gray and it's gray and it's dark and i i i have a sad (laughs) every time i try to play it so i mean me personally i actually kind of have an affinity for this sort of aesthetic just Sure. As I said, because it's kind of like the the extreme of that mundane meets fantasy that I was talking about, where this is like the most depressingly real to the point of so overkill that it be loops back around in on itself and becomes unreality again. A uh, fantasy yeah. of, say, um, anthropomorphic rabbit creatures um working in this dingy factory, getting filthy and worried that their supervisors are going to come by and scold them. Uh, right. But, uh... Yeah. I, I do not think it's contentious at all, even though I like the aesthetics of this world, to say that... I mean, I mean, I don't think it's controversial to say that Grunty Industries is the most contentious world in Banjo-Tooie. I have probably seen more people cite it as their least favorite than any other world. Um, this, this is the world that breaks people when when they're trying to beat the game. It, I think a lot of people tap out at Grunny Industries because it, they can't figure it out. It, it's a world that I've come to appreciate more with age because I've had more time to sit with it and realize this world is a puzzle box. Yeah. And it's kind of and, a thing you know, where the more time you spend with it, the more rewarding it is as you kind of learn the lay of the land and realize where bits and pieces go but because this is so late in the game, I think where it comes, pe- people are kind of like, they want to be done, they want to move on to Hellfire Peaks. They've, they've seen yeah. this before, and it's just, it's it's a lot to drop on somebody af- in the, like, mi- like, just over the midpoint of the game. Yeah, I, that's why I think mentally I always place it later in the game. It's like the penultimate world in, instead of where it is. Because it, it definitely it makes more feels sense that way. Like this is the yeah. this is the Rusty Bucket Bay of Pinjo Tui is what it is. And Rusty Bucket Bay, you know, it had that same dreariness to it, but it also had the nautical theme, and it it had more going for it than Grun- Grunny Industries is just like rusty bucket bay but stripped of all remaining natural beauty <laughs> it, it, I, I will say like if if dreariness is the metric by which you're judging um country industries and rusty bucket bay rusty bucket bay is kind of whimsical in how bad it is yeah grunty industries yeah. is a lot more still whimsical but a lot more um just cynical i suppose about I, you it. know and, and i Comparing it to the Donkey Kong Country factories and uh, either, you know, Creme Croc in the original, Mechanos in 3, or even, you know, the return to Creme Croc in, in Factory in, in Returns uh, and Tropical Freeze, uh, I, I think the difference here is, you know, in a 2D platformer, it's more of a driving experience. Like, it, it's more like I'm blazing through this factory, you've got the, the music that's... Uh, either you know David Wise's Fear Factory or Evelyn Fisher's Led Zeppelin knockoff, which are both uh, both work spectacularly well. But in a 3D platformer, it's more like you're in it, and there's no like forward momentum. It, it's it is a puzzle box, and it's slower, and it's more methodical, and it it can break you. Um, and, and also the like the aesthetic of Granny Industries is sort of it's an old factory it's run down it's got a lot of like technological newness in areas but is it's it's not quite the same kind of like heavy metal experience of creme croc or something um it, it reminds me a little bit of frantic factory which is also a world i i find kind of draining but I found Fran- Frantic Factory less draining than Grunny Industry. I think because Grunny Industries is so massive and it is a puzzle from the very start, you don't even know how to get into the world. And I, I admire that. Like, I don't have an issue with, with, 
um, the fact that you have to take Chuffy into the world from another world to actually get inside the real factory. I, I think that's brilliant. It's a really um, bold design decision because I feel like um, a less the less confident choice would be to say, well, what if people just throw up their hands and never get inside this level because they can't figure it out? Which happened. It happened so much. And I remember like when Banjo-Tooie was new how that was a constant source of discussion on DK Vine and on uh, being like rare was constantly questioned about it on their website. Just like, how do I get into Grunny Industries? I know that was like a constant thing. People called into the Nintendo Power uh, game counselors about uh, like, but yeah, it, it, you, you, you unlock the world. You can roam the, the, grounds on like the front gate but to actually get in there you have to um open the door for chuffy leave grunny industries go into another world and then take chuffy into the actual factory itself i i love it i i love that kind of outside the box um, method because uh, it feels like you're cheating almost to get into the world. It doesn't feel like it's the right way to go about it. So I can yeah, see what from an in-universe so perspective, this also makes a lot of sense. Well, like, how do you get into the enemy's um, factory? Well, you sneak in by way of the supply chain. And this, this is going to be my only bit of political commentary this episode. Uh, it shouldn't be harder to get into Grunny Industries than it is the U.S. Capitol. Okay, that's it. Uh, <laughs> all right, so Grunny Industry, it's, it's going to be hard for me to talk about, honestly, Cameron, because it is such... Because we don't have four hours. Because we don't have four hours. I mean, we, we, we usually go near four hours on this show, but um, we don't have four hours this, just this, to This episode will Industries. take less time than it takes to get through everything in Grunty Industries. And honestly, as much as I pride myself as being this kind of keeper of the lore this knowledge of the dku grunny industries is a blur in my head it is a blind spot sp blind spot i can't even say it. it it makes no sense to me it's a blind spot that even when i like play it or even when i go back and watch uh walkthroughs of grunny industries i just kind of go into this meditative state i don't know what's happening and i just remember key interactions interactions with characters um but i don't really like remember point a to point b or point a to point z as as it is in grunty industries it's it's just i i, yeah, I it, it, it's really where tui loses the plot in my head because Everything is just so visually samey to me. And and I, that's not a criticism. I, I like Grunny Industries for what it is. It's just for the type of gamer I am, it's daunting to kind of commit to memory. Yeah, um, just as a personal story, like... I think with most of Rare's games, like, once I, even if I have a ton of trouble with them the first time through... Um, g generally, if I like it enough to give it a s multiple playthroughs, by the second one, I have retained enough memory of how I did everything to get by. Um, or, like, bearing, like, you know, there might be, like, one or two bonus rooms in Donkey Kong Country 1 or 2, well, more than 1 or 2, really, that I forget and either have to bang my head up against the wall trying to figure out or eventually break down and consult the guide. I have a player's guide for Banjo-Tooie from 2000, and, like, decades after the fact, I have gone back to that guide and looked at the maps because I can't figure something out. Um, yeah. Most no most notably of all, Clinker's Cavern. Like, especially mm -hmm. Clinker's Cavern. Yeah. Yeah. And and Clinker's Cavern also, I'm, you just said Clinker's Cavern, I was like, that was in the first game. What are you talking? Oh, right. Clinkers. Because I forgot about clinkers. I forgot. I put them in the show notes. I, I thought I didn't. Okay. Apparently, I, I just imagined that. But clinkers. I forgot all about clinkers. The little poopy amoeba things. Um, and 
I forgot about the cavern because it's just a blind sp- spot to me. It's just now you you like, thought you thought the rest of Grunchy Industries was a maze that you couldn't wrap your head around. Yeah. Welcome yeah. to Clinker's Cavern. I uh, yeah, Grunny Industries is definitely my mm. least favorite world. Like top of the list, Witchy World, then part of Jolly Rogers Lagoon, then Terry Dactyl Land. Grunny Industries, though, complete bottom of the yeah, heap. I, again, again, I don't hate it because I don't hate anything about this game except the googly eye banjo because you would cartridge. But it's I I can't sit yeah, here as, and I, tell you about Grunny Industries because. <laughs> It's it's all uh, just this convoluted mess in my head. Yeah, as I said, I, I've gotten to like it more with age um, as I've kind of accumulated to like, OK, well, I know this is on this floor and that's on that floor. And oh, OK, that makes a kind of logical sense. And the more time you spend with the world, it rewards you for um, spending time with it. Like you unlock the doors on the fire escape, the um, service elevator um, which I guess, I guess I was going to say those make it easier to get around, but also um, the um, giant elevator shaft is also one of the most entertaining uh, parts of Banjo-Tooie for reasons that have nothing to do with actually playing the game the way that you're supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the elevator shaft, um, the one that seems to be out of order, um, the, because there's two elevators, um... I one, one is an elevator exclusively for use by mechanical personnel, which means the washing machine. Um, mm-hmm. Grunty Industries seems to, in general, have like a heavy bias toward automation. Um, but um, that elevator shaft, I think it's probably the like the the longest drop in the entire game if you climb up to the top of the elevator shaft and drop all the way down. So if you just want to hear Banjo scream in its entirety as he plummets from log knows how high in the air and slam as hard as he possibly can against the ground, um, have some fun with that shaft. <laughs> <laughs> oh... Yeah. And if you have the fallproof yeah. cheat, he'll just get right back up from it. Which is entertaining in its own right, yeah. <laughs> For me, the thing I remember about Grunny Industries is Lago and, and bringing Lago back from Mad Monster Mansion. Fan favorite character because most of us were kids and it was a talking toilet full of piss and shit. So, of <laughs> course, we're going to love Lago and they brought him back. They they actually specified that Grunny ripped him out of the mansion and installed him in her factory, which I don't know when she did this. I guess at some point in Banjo-Tooie, she was like, you know what? Well, I want to take a shit in my my personal anthropomorphic toilet. Send for Lago and and maybe some skivvies, the, the worker rabbits or whatever. Uh, went back to my Mad Monster Mansion. Somehow got into Grunny's lair. Maybe through, maybe they broke in through the uh, the upper windows and uh, and and went down into Mad Monster Mansion's entrance and brought Lago and dragged him back through a digger tunnel. I, however this happened, it happened and and Lago is here. But um, yeah, Lago. Um, it was, it was just great to see this. Again, one of the best things about Banjo-Tooie were how they brought back characters from Banjo-Kazooie and just these side characters and found new use for them. Like, life goes on, oh, blood the oh, blood da, two years and, later. And and also just the payoff that Lago and Cheeto specifically were punished for helping Banjo and Kazooie by Gruntilda. Yeah, yeah. So, like, there there are consequences to the events of Banjo Kazooie, and, and so like, I yeah, I, I love like seeing like characters like Konga who are like maybe in deeper with Grunty, you know, working in Witchy World, whereas like Lago is is uh, now I, I I would rather I'd be in the he, workers' he's, quarter. He's on her shit list. Ah, uh, <laughs> I see, I see. <laughs> Honestly, I would rather be in the workers' quarters of Grunny Industries 
versus being in Mad Monster Mansion. So I think it was actually a, a step up for Lago. Now, maybe Lago is just a Halloween fanatic, and, and this is a, a downgrade for him, but... Uh, those worker quarters were pretty nice, all things it, considered. They were the nicest part of Grunny Industries. They are. Um, they still um, are full of tin tops, which is... I think that's my biggest complaint with Grunty Industries, not to get too far off of the thread, but it, if I could change one thing about Grunty Industries, it would be that if you take out the security cameras, the tin tops don't spawn for the rest of that save file because I think they're a little bit obnoxious. They are, um, yeah. The security uh, drones in various open spots in Grunty Industries. I think 90% of the time I don't even bother with the camera. I just let them spawn and avoid them. <laughs> yeah, they, like, they're like they obnoxious. Although, for me, the more memorable baddies... And we'll go back to Logo here, but um, the more memorable baddies just because of the historical curiosity that these even exist in this game, are uh, the anthropomorphic nuts and the anthropomorphic bolts that harass Banjo and Kazooie. Uh, their, their official names are Nutta and Boltoid. Uh, and then there's also Wash-Ups, which are anthropomorphic washers. But I, I love that there are actual nuts and bolts plaguing Banjo and Kazooie in Banjo Tooie. <laughs> it's just a uh, a nice little portent of things to come. Um, but uh, Lago, uh, I, I want to mention, Lago makes, in the N64 version, which is specifically what this conversation is about, maybe someday down the line we'll do an official conversation on the XBLA version, but... Uh, in the N64 version, there is an explicit reference to Mario. Um, Lago is complaining he's clogged, I believe, with a, a Cheeto page. Um, I think it's and, like the workers haven't been treating him great and stuffed some stuffed uh, paper down his chute and clogged him up. Yeah, yeah, but Kazooie. But there is a Cheeto page in there, yes. Yeah. Kazooie uh, asked, if, you know, wh why why are they asking them? What, why is Lago asking Banjo and Kazooie, like, give Mario a call? And and Yeah, M Mario doesn't have to unclog toilets with his face like Kazooie does. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so surreal. Like, I know Donkey Kong Country 2 had a blatant reference to Mario and Yoshi and Link. And a, and, a, and a more obtuse reference to Sonic the Hedgehog and Earthworm Jim. But it's weird to me that Mario is name-dropped in a Banjo-Kazooie game to that extent. In, in the XB Olive version, they changed it to, like, a mustachioid uh, Italian man or something. Yeah, it's still uh, alluding to Mario. It's like, I think yeah. they, the, like, find and replace is that well-known Italian one. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, it makes sense from the perspective of the year 2000. Banjo-Tooie was published by Nintendo. The characters were uh, at least partially owned by Nintendo. So, you know, yeah, I referenced Mario. But, you know, considering, like, Rare, Rare had built up their own, like... You know, it, it, we we call it the DKU, but you could you can call it the shared year, rare universe. And to have Mario, like we know Mario and Donkey Kong interact uh, quite a bit, especially by this point in time. So to see Kazooie mention Mario, my brain is thinking, yeah, I wonder if Kazooie, like I wonder if like the Mario Kart races were televised or something, and, and like that's how she knows about Mario. It's it's. It's funny to There's, me just to imagine the events of the cameo games uh, being known to Banjo and Kazooie. Yeah, there's even like definite like shared universe implications in Logo's response because Kazooie's crack about Mario could just as easily be taken of like, well, oh, why don't you call insert fictional character? And instead, Logo yeah. responds, "I don't think he does that kind of work anymore." Right, like right. saying, Which "I could call Mario." But he's not going to help. Right, which actually, you know, Nintendo has said in recent years that Mario is not a plumber anymore. And uh, that that actually ties right in with Nintendo's current 
lore for Mario, but um, uh, that yeah, that's uh, that that just kind of cool thing that like had Rare and Nintendo remain partners. Uh, I, I, you know, we all, we, we could have even seen Mario and crew appearing in Diddy Kong Pilots, so, uh, who knows, but it, it's, it's interesting to see, like, the connections between Donkey Kong and Mario, if they would bleed any more into, uh, the, the so-called Donkey Kong spinoffs, like Banjo-Kazooie, um, probably not Conquer, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's 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 a fascinating glimpse into what may have been, and um, another connection, um, which which is m- more so rare, just having inside jokes and them being reused between the teams, rather than a purposeful shared universe thing, is the um, Baza Super Life batteries that are power so much in Grunny Industries. Now, Baza uh, is also the name of the Barracuda baddies in Donkey Kong Country 3. And I think this is just kind of like the Jetpacks and Butlers thing that uh, Conker mentioned and then later appeared as a business book in Con- Ukulele. Conker has its own Baza, one of the Dung Beetles. Fuck yeah! Fuck yeah he does! So, uh, Baza just pops up so much between, uh, the, these three games and the, the three main branches of the DKU. And <laughs> that's just, you know, rare being rare, but it, it makes me, in my fan and like to think that Baza, uh, as an in-universe term first started as the Barracuda and then this battery brand, um, came about as like after the fact and they named them after the Kremlin crew oriented Barracuda. I think we we because... stumbled onto the the like the Donkey Kong universe equivalent of like Doctor Who's Bad Wolf. <laughs> Maybe when I finally get my hands uh, on like actually writing lore in in something, I can I can shoehorn that in like log imprinted on the universe <laughs> the word Baza but um no in, in my head canon uh the battery brand in Manjo Tui is named after the Barracudas because it's just as persistent and tenacious as they are <laughs> uh I don't know about the dung beetle maybe the dung beetle uh w- was just named after them because their his parents really liked fish poop I don't, I don't, I don't know, Cameron. I don't know. I'm doing this for too long. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, there are also Twinklies in, in right? There are Twinklies in uh, Grunty Industries, and that's confusing to me because the Twinkly Munchler, Mun, Twinkie Munchler, Munch, ah, Twinkie Munchers. Fuck. Uh, <laughs> I'm not drunk. You are drunk. Uh, the Twinkie Munch Munchers are in Witchy World, and um, they don't munch Twinklies uh, in in Grunny Industries. So uh, yeah, Twinkie but, but, Twinklies have kind of a re- recurring appearances in Tui that are completely divorced from the role they played in Kazooie. Yeah, yeah, a- and here in Grunny Industries, you're packaging them right. So. Wait, Grunny Industries is an underwear factory, but they also, like, have this side hustle going on with holiday decor? <laughs> I, I don't... I, 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 I guess maybe it can only... It's only really a market that's viable for them around uh, the holidays, so... They gotta, they gotta have more eggs in, in... Their eggs in more than just one basket. Considering that Banjo Tooie did come out in late November, yeah, yeah, ship out those. It would make sense too, right? Because Grunny, uh, it, assuming Grunny is responsible for the Twinklies in Freezy Z Peak, she was probably thinking like, you know, hey, I could make some, I can make some coin off of these if I if I ship them around the Rare Archipelago, uh, come holiday season, and why not use my pre-existing underwear factory and distribution networks uh, for and this. To get people so, to, and to get people to buy more Twinklies, you set up Twinkly Munchers right in front of every Christmas tree. 
<laughs> so yeah, yeah, we we get to see some of Gruntilda's broader capitalistic uh, aspirations from from her factory here, um, and and then I I don't even know where to, like again Grunty Industries is such a labyrinth that I I don't even know like there's not even a segue I can take it's just like uh should we talk about the boss I don't even know let's talk about Weldar. Weldar. Weldar is a boss that, because of just how Grunty Industries is, I didn't even fight Weldar until I had finished the game. Really? That's how... That's how yeah, that's how obtuse Weldar was to find for me. Like, I, I, I would think, like... beat Gruntilda before fighting Weldar. I think the modern equivalent of that phenomenon might be um, inept in capital casino and ukulele where he uh he's hiding at the end of the cartas sequence so, um and again uh, an- another robotic baddie um so um anyway but weldar mm-hmm. is a giant um and welder and, like and a, in hindsight a, a, i don't think he's like especially difficult to get to but you might not expect that the route you're taking to get to him leads to a boss fight yeah, yeah. Which is why I didn't think anything of it. I feel like but I already I... shit talk Welder um, in, in this podcast when I said that you know Terry is much more memorable than Weldar. I the the shame is like is I think Weldar is the one of the boss is the boss you have to go the most out of your way to find, but I do think he's an entertaining boss as a character. He's and an entertaining as a fight. boss. He's an it's an entertaining fight. Um, as far as a character goes, he's just a big blowtorch. So oh, he's a big blowtorch who is nearsighted because I mean, he's a something. welding torch yeah. with with a big bright flame spewing from his mouth, and he doesn't have protective headgear. Right. With I I I do appreciate that the irony that if there was an anthropomorphic blowtorch. Uh, then th- that anthropomorphic blowtorch would not be able to wear a welding mask, therefore would be nearsighted, and the existential horror of just that entire scenario. Um, but, yeah, yeah, wel- Weldar is a big torch, and you fight him. <laughs> Maybe I'm shortchanging him, but again, Grunny Industries, is, it's like a black hole in my brain, Cameron, and I can't retain anything except in the, the outer rim of it, where, where time start slowing down before it gets sucked in completely. Uh, I know Lago, I know Baza, uh, Nutta, and Boltoid. He's also um, another boss like... He's also another boss like um, Lord Wu Fakfak in that he sticks around after you've killed him to yeah. tell you where the Jiggy you got for beating him is. Well, you don't kill him because, because he well, sticks around, but... Well, yeah, I, I'm overstating it but after you defeat him i should say you sure sure you i mean most of the time when you blow up something's body that would imply you've killed it but what weldar sticks around as just a head like um like the like the mouse in conquer <laughs> which is more horrifying in conquer at least with <laughs> well, because it's a mouse <laughs> yeah with weldar there's a built-in explanation oh he's, he's a robot machine or, or at least an anthropomorphic mechanical being, so it, it's it's perfectly fine. It makes sense because there's no internal organs there. But when you're a mouse, that later comes back all stitched up. Anyway, um, the the most memorable thing about Grunny Industries is the fact they repurpose, they bring back the washing machine transformation from which which was one of the premium secrets in banjo kazooie uh they bring it back here but it's actually more of a transformation humba's version of it isn't just a reskinned banjo it's actually yeah. it's its own thing this time around and, and we should clarify that it's the the washing machine is a super secret cheat in banjo kazooie but it is also a one-off joke that happens by random chance sure if Matt Mumbo gets a spell wrong, like, it's explicitly a mistake that he's turned you into a washing machine. Yeah. And, and then, you know, you can run around Banjo-Kazooie as the washing machine, which is, again, just a reskinned Banjo, but it's it's a joke, and it's funny, and it's amusing, and 
um, what have you. But uh, here, you know, it, it does its own thing. It's it's more plotting, but it can shoot uh, tidy whities and it can also clean um, the the uniforms of the rabbits. So. Um, it actually serves a role other than a one-note joke. So, um, because of that, like, it's more memorable for me uh, as far as when I think back to Banjo-Tooie transformations, like, the washing machine is right up there due to its connection with the original Banjo-Tooie. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, it can kind of help you... It, it can't accomplish much on its own, um, barring a few things like helping out the skivvy rabbits and getting past a few tasks that require it, but um, it can help you get the lay of the land in Grunty Industries because it can take the elevator reserved for mechanical personnel. Yeah, yeah, which which is very useful uh, when trying to navigate the, the nightmare that is the layout. At the very least, help you like de- sort of gauge which floor does which thing and which landmarks are nearby, even if you can't necessarily navigate to every room as the washing machine yeah yeah which you know if you don't have the player's guide from the year 2000 um that might be the only way you can actually figure it out so all right can we move on to hellfire peaks (laughs) (laughs) yes yes we can we've got the bare minimum amount of jiggies we needed out of grunty industries thank log all right let's let's go on to hellfire peaks which is at least half the lava world uh, of Banjo Kazooie fame, uh, where when Gobi says he's going to run off to the lava world um, from Click Clock Wood, he was in fact referring to Hellfire Peaks, not Mount Fire Eyes, not a super secret world that would rise up from the lava room in Granny's Lair, not a world in Jet Force Gemini. No, no, no. The lava world is. The island, or, or the offshore islet of Hailfire Peaks. One half volcanic, the other half frozen. So, as I said, I always confuse this with the fifth world for, for some reason. I, I think, I always think this comes right after Jolly Rogers Lagoon, and maybe it's because it is this offshore islet, um, that it just, it would make sense that chronologically it would follow on from Jolly Rogers Lagoon, but um, no, it's it's seventh. Um, so I don't. But it's a lot less claustrophobic than Grunny Industries, and uh, you spend a large part of it outdoors, uh, especially on the ice side. So yeah, yeah let's let's dive in. So I always. Th- think of Hailfire Peaks as like a really novel concept, but when I step back there, like the, the mix of fire and ice is something that's actually in a lot of games, um, including a lot of DKU games. Um, like this same concept shows up in Chill and Char Island in uh, Jungle Climber, um, Freezing Furnace in Grunty's Revenge. I think they even have like a TV Tropes page just named Hailfire Peaks because of this world. Um, uh, actually, up, yeah, but... spe- speaking of freezing furnace too, it should should also point out uh, before we completely close the book on Grunty Industries that freezing furnace was <clears throat> where uh, we saw the beginnings of Grunty Industries because that was where Grunty back in 1978 first set up shop for Grunty Industries in in the uh, the fiery it... cauldrons of. Oh, it's such a puzzle friends. box, it's spewed into a completely unrelated game. <laughs> Backwards through time. Um, no, but uh, but yeah, Hellfire Peaks, it seemed novel at the time, even though it's been done um, quite a bit. It at the very least in, in was the my first exposure to this idea, so sure. at least I remember it for that. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, Hellfire Peaks, it, it, it's also, like, bold of them, because, you know, we, we were expecting a lava world, and instead to, like, only give us, like, half of that, and then have another snow world, but one that is, I think, much less holiday-themed than Freezy Z Peak. Freezy Z Peak was more, like, 
the Northern Hemisphere take on uh, Christmas and the holiday season. And w- I think uh, the ice side of Hailfire Peaks was more just winter. Uh, ice, winter. Ice side is more like a Matterhorn kind of environment. Like the, yeah. Like just a big, scary winter environment. It, it's it's winter after the 12 days of Christmas. It's winter when the decor comes down. It's, oh, yeah, the last three months I mean, of it, winter. It's a, it's a mountain, so it's just naturally snowy all the time. Right, yeah. It, high it, altitude. It's, it's, but it's something different, at least. Yeah, it's, it, it's it, a different it way of presenting like, an ice world than what we usually see. It's more of a Donkey Kong way of presenting uh, a snow world. So, um... But yeah, Gobi is on, or eventually reaches the fireside. Uh, <laughs> I guess Donkey he... Kong Island kind of becomes the Hailfire Peaks in the last world of Tropical Freeze. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, well, actually, yeah, when we look at Volcano uh, from Donkey Kong Country Returns, that was geographically at one point Gorilla Glacier, so... Uh, I guess Gorilla Glacier slash Volcano is always just swinging back and forth between between the two. But uh, Gobi shows up. Like I, I love that this expectation is dashed. That Gobi was running off to the lava world at, at you know in Click Clock Wood, but he gets there right when Bancho and Kazooie get there uh, <laughs> because he was detained in Witchy World for you know two years or so. Uh, that it's just a nice little um, shattering of expectations there, but but Gobi, Gobi does arrive. They do pay off that little bit um, from Manjo Kazooie, just like the T Rex spell was there's, was paid off. There's a very like satisfyingly roundabout puzzle he's tied to too, um, which is um, so there's the final train station in the entire game is in Hailfire Peaks. And there's a jiggy at the end of it, but it's on the ice side. And going from the fire to the ice side will basically, because of the extreme temperature, extreme sharp temperature di- difference, will destroy Chuffy's boiler and kill Old King Cole if he goes through it without cooling the engine down a little bit or cooling cooling yeah. the boiler. So you need something to cool it down. And uh, Gobi, who Ran off at the end of Banjo Kazooie, got captured earlier in Banjo Tooie, was freed from his cell, and is now finally made it to the lava world. And you gotta drain his water to cool down Chuffy's boiler. Yeah, poor Gobi. Because, you know, when you first meet Gobi, he's just abused in Gobi's Valley by Banjo and Kazooie. Uh, he's freed at first, and you're like, okay, great. And then Banjo and Kazooie. Hound is back, cause him to spew out water all over Trunker. Gobi runs off to Click Clock Wood. They they pound on him again to cause the flower to grow. He he tries to escape to the lava world, gets captured. Banjo and Kazooie free him again, and then once he gets to the lava world, they pound on him a third time. And and, and in his own words. All the water that they pound out of him in Tui was all the water he had saved up between the events the last uh, the last game. And then he's just broken <laughs> at, at that point on. He just like he gives up. You know? <laughs> he left him so stranded without him. water on a volcano. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fairly dark as far as like, cause, you know, like that's the last we see of him in Tui, <laughs> and he's just. <laughs> Uh, you know, and that that, that is like, especially in Banjo Tooie, is a reoccurring comedic point that sometimes Banjo and Kazooie leave these characters uh, in a worse shape uh, than they found them. Sometimes they help oh, them, geez. like they did, like they did now, uh, now the I'm, dinosaurs. I was making a joke, but now I am really worried about Gobi. I don't think there's any proof of life for him in Nuts and Bolts. Yeah, yeah, I, I was trying. Well, I, I think Go no. Uh, I was going to say he appears in a cameo in Banjo Pilot, but I think those are other camels uh, in Gobi's Valley, but it's not actually Gobi himself. They're, they're Gobi's so, model. 
at least. It's their Gobi's model, but I don't think it's necessarily supposed to be Gobi. It, it's just more camels being held in yeah Gobi's but if we're gonna if we're gonna say that the ostrich is definitely espresso maybe at least one of those camels has to be Gobi. i i just i i want to feed into your theory that Gobi died i don't die on the die. lava side. i'm just worried about him is <laughs> well as we, is Gobi okay as we see later in this world death is not necessarily permanent in banjo tui so, you know, Gobi might have died, but he can always get better. So long as he gets to the ice side and he preserves that body of his, <laughs> he can always be revived later on. Um, so let, let's, let's talk about, um, some of the characters on the ice side, because this is really, uh, a, an eclectic group that, um, I, I think there there are many beloved DK Vine stalwarts yeah, here be- on the ice before side. Before seeing that all laid out in the show notes, I like I have in my head that the ice side of Hailfire Peaks is very desolate, but no, there are so many big names on this side of Hailfire Peaks. Yeah, and, and uh, first immediately is, is Boggy and family. Boggy, Mrs. Boggy, and the kids. This is where they're living now. They have left Freezy Z Peak. They have left that cramped one-room igloo, which I don't even know where Mrs. Boggy would have sat in that place. But they've left Freezy Z Peak. They moved to the ice side of Hailfire Peaks. And they've got a much more spacious igloo now with separate rooms and uh, a state-of-the-art ice tv and state of the art for the year 2000 at least and um yeah it, it, it's kind of cool to see like again like nothing is static it nothing is set in stone except the stonies in the banjo kazooie uh, corner of the dku so you know characters move characters you know they they change jobs they you know, yeah, they, they get into new situations, and here we got you know these these freezy Z peak natives uh, living somewhere else, and and um, uh, yeah, Boggy he moved he moved from freezy Z peak, but he's not doing so much moving anymore. He's he's kind of regressed to a couch potato. He has, and so and a very he, a what, kind what of disgusting he, couch potato, as we'll get into. As we'll get into, yes. Um, so, first of all, the, the upshot is he does have good taste in television programming because he is watching Mr. Pants on TV, and the program consists of nothing but Mr. Pants dancing on TV. So, I, I think our fan conjecture is that this was an early TV show Mr. Pants had where it consisted of nothing but him dancing in his underwear for I don't know 44 minutes or so and I, in my headcanon it's pants dance um or or pants pants revolution um but it's yeah, yeah it's I, just I him dancing with dancing. pants D- dancing with pants okay it but sounds like a TGIF show <laughs> I like that in this universe that Mr. Pants is is such a celebrity who can do whatever he wants and everybody will lap it up that this hit program is just this pale, paunchy, middle-aged British man dancing in red underwear and a bowler hat and it's just this like this runaway hit that people can't get enough of. They're just watching it and transfixed by it and, and devising all sorts of hidden meanings behind it and what it's actually a commentary on and 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 this is what we we walk into boggy watching and this is the first actual physical appearance of mr pants in a video game and this is uh th- this is supported by the fact that in the character parades uh the, w- the way they do the character parades at the end of banjo tui is that they it, they have they actually mash up the staff credits with characters. Um, so well, there, there's you, a separate character got... parade you can unlock, but the credit sequence right. has um, 
I think most of the names in the credits, uh, I think generally, I think it's all of the rare employees at least, um, have assigned to them a jokey nickname, middle name, in parentheses, that is taking a character who appears elsewhere in Banjo-Tooie. Yes, yes. And so every, every, you know, every, like, almost every character gets represented in this uh, staff character parade mashup. And then for Lee Loveday, it's Lee Mr. Pants Loveday. And so we, we've taken this to mean this is actually a physical appearance of Mr. Pants uh, on this TV program. And uh, obviously Mr. Pants did appear in the um, Jet Force Gemini cheat that turned all the ants into reskin Mr. Pants. But we, we take that more to be a reference rather than an actual physical appearance because none of those ants were actually Mr. Pants. It's it's the same thing as yeah. DK mode and Goldeneye. It's it's you're changing their proportions to resemble something, but it's not actually the and character appearing. I, I've seen it like posited. Well, yeah, it says his name in the credits, but how do you know he's not still just a fictional like animated show in the context of Banjo Tooie? And the answer to that is there are other characters in Banjo-Tooie who don't physically appear, um, who um, aren't named in the credits. Um, Donkey Kong appears in the game by way of a doll. He, his name is not in the credits. Juno and Vela from Jet Force Gemini appear on posters in the game. They're not in the credits. Elvis gets refer- right. from Perfect Dark gets referenced in dialogue. He's not in the credits. Mr. Pants mm-hmm. is the only, like... Banjo outsider character other than Saberman to get a reference in the credits as he does. Right. And so this is why all, all the references to Banjo or all the references to Mr. Pants in uh, in Banjo Tooie uh, cuz Mr. Pants also appears as a constellation in Witchy World, um, an artificial constellation in the Dodgem Dome. But uh, then he, of course, has numerous references in Grab by the Ghoulies, uh, Viva Pinata, Nuts and Bolts. But um, th- this is where he actually appears as a real flesh and blood character. And then, of course, he would get his own game in It's Mr. Pants. And that is why we consider it part of the DKU. So there you go. Um, Boggy is also a gross weirdo in that he <laughs> has what's ostensibly a porn DVD called Bear Babes, and he asked if Banjo wants to sit around and watch this with him in a living room. And it would be one thing if this was just something that came up in private, but the fact that Boggy's family are all existing in the adjacent rooms, and Boggy's like, hey, do you want to watch a porno with me, Banjo? She's like, what the fuck, Boggy? (laughs) At this point, at this point, Cameron, they had to know that Boggy was a trash character. Like, like, as as far as like, oh, wow, he came off really shitty in Banjo-Kazooie. Why don't we just double down on it? It reminds me of the U.S. office. At a certain point, they decided that the characters of Ryan and Kelly were just going to be irrede- irredeemable. They were just going to be utterly loathsome human beings because they, they looked at like their past actions and they were like, wow, they're kind of shitty. What if we just ran with that? That's, that's essentially what <laughs> becomes a boggy here. Holy shit. <laughs> and, and, and that it's, it's just shocking. Now, again, this is, this was a Nintendo published game. Like, it's not as shocking. From, they like, they, oh, they owned these game. characters at this point. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think, like, in light of Conqueror's Bad Fur Day, like, that was the Rubicon that was crossed, where it was no longer shocking that Rare was doing this kind of stuff, but that this was, at one point, a f- like considered a first-party Nintendo game, or at least, you know, published by Nintendo, owned by Nintendo, Nintendo IPs, and that, you know, okay, may- maybe something like, you know captain rainbow or something that would be japan only this this stuff would have flown but from the western nintendo fan perspective where nintendo is this very like chaste conservative company 
that, you know, is very concerned about their image. Boggy is like, hey, I got the new Bear Babes DVD. Should be hot stuff. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, it's not even just like an allude. Like, there are... There's comically alluding to porno or like a nudie mag or something illicit. It's another thing to say, I have this. Do you, this casual acquaintance <laughs> of mine, want to come in my house and watch it with me <laughs> and yeah just wow right yeah i i think it might even be more egregious to me than the pterodactyl land phallus because it, it's it's one thing to hide something in the like the landscape of a world and then have plausible deniability we didn't mean for it to look like that and then just to have the dialogue be straight up. Yeah, do, do you want to watch a porno with B? It should be pretty arousing. Uh, yeah, Bo- Bo- Boggy is, is trash, and I love him for that. Like, I, I don't actually, like, like the character, but I like the character. He, he, he's an I always like sunny in character. Philadelphia character. Yes, he is. What he, Boggy he is. is yeah, and it, actually, I was I was thinking of it's always sunny too because there was that like public access show of the man dancing in his underwear that they were all transfixed on um, in that one episode, and that reminds me of Mr. Pants. So Boggy is very much an it's always sunny character, and I really in when we eventually get a new banjo game, I really want the full extent of his depravity to be explored. I want him to go full Frank Reynolds and just have him be an out and out like fringe living dirtbag. I think that would be um, an ex- uh, an exciting angle to explore with him. All right, but I, I think we've said enough about Buggy. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about outside the igloo. Let's talk about um, well, let's talk about some of the the, the baddies, because we see for the first time in the DKU, yetis, or, or um, snow apes uh, of some snor- sorts, in the Biggiefoots, which which are, are baddies you can encounter. And then there is the primary one in Banjo-Tooie, Bigafoot, uh, who is who is the, the Biggiefoot with the biggest foot, um, or he's got one big foot. And these uh, these would actually resurface in Grunny's Revenge in Freezing Furnace. And they they would come back as uh, as baddies, but um, and they'd even get yeah, like a swamp variant as well. Yes, which uh, it actually tie if you're into cryptozoology at all does tie into cryptozoology because in uh, in the mythical forest ape uh, lore, you know we've got Sasquatch in the North American. Uh, forest. You, we've got yetis uh, in in the like Himalayas, and then we've got swamp apes or or skunk apes in the the more southern uh, marshlands, wetlands, uh, and that that is what uh, that is what we see in Granny's Revenge. So I, I like that it's not the Donkey Kong games that first get to touch upon these. Um, these these mythical um, rumored apes of legend, but it's Banjo Kazooie that does it. Um, now we're gonna talk a lot about death and rebirth. So the, <laughs> I was mentioning how Banjo and Kazooie occasionally um, leave characters in worse shape than they found them. Um, in their quest to collect all the jiggies or free the jinjos or, or whatever, sometimes there's collateral damage. We saw it with Gobi, just the utter breaking ruinization of Gobi. And we see it with the ice cube couple, couple of Hailfire Peaks. Uh, there is George Ice Cube and there is Mildred Ice Cube. Which one do we actually encounter in Hailfire? It's Mildred, right? Yes, it's Mildred, who yes. is looking for her missing hus- husband, and uh, 
is, has a Jinjo frozen inside of her that she refuses to let go until you can deliver her husband. Right. So <laughs> the way the way to free the Jinjo is just to it's uh I think just a simple beak barge, right? Or is it um there might be more than one way to take to um end the Mildred, but I think uh Bill Drill is usually <laughs> what I've used. Um, okay. So yeah. for co- for context, um for reasons that will become apparent in the very next world, um George's return is unlikely to happen. Um Right. So, so Mildred is holding this Jinjo um presumably on the brink of death, um, captive. And there's absolutely no way to um, negotiate its safe return. So you're forced to destroy Mildred Ice Cube. Right. And and I think it's... It, I don't know if Banjo and Kazooie were like, well, we just got to straight up kill her. I was like, let's let's extract the Jinjo from, from her frozen... Uh, water, a frozen crystalline body, and of course it just shatters her completely. The end. Of, the end. End of Mildred. Um. It's it, it's one of the darkest moments in Banjo Kazooie, and I think because they know it resonated with people, it formed a lot of the basis for the humor in Ukulele. And nuts and bolts a little bit. I, I nuts and bolts had uh, I think different sorts of gallows humor, but uh, ukulele definitely uh, I think carried that torch. Um, it, At the it, very like, least, much, in much terms more of like, did did they just murder somebody? Um, yeah, there 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 especially I'm, the the one boss fight in particular uh, is is kind of um, forms the. I like, have to think that. That reads as a direct nod to the, the fate of the ice cubes in this game. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would say, you say this is the one of the darkest moments in Banjo 2. I would say what happens to George is even darker, because at least with Mildred, it's quick. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's done and over, and it's just like she doesn't, she didn't suffer much. Uh, but I, I should also point out that... Also, she was doing George, something, she was doing something bad in holding the Jinjo against his will. George isn't really doing anything wrong when you meet him. Poor poor George just wanted to get back to Mildred. Uh, it, it's worth pointing out, too, when we talk about, you know, building upon what came before from Banjo-Kazooie, George and Mildred are chinkers, the ice cube baddies in Freeze Z Peak. They are not baddies in Banjo-Tooie, right? They don't appear anywhere else in Banjo-Tooie except for this... NPC couple that you quote unquote help, but um, I, I love that we can meet friendly versions of baddies. Like uh, it's, I I I was personally disappointed at the time, um, Hellfire Peaks that Sir Slushes didn't come back because of course you know my my early internet screen name and my username still on the DK Vine forum as an artifact of that era was uh, Sir Slush 2 at AOL.com, uh, just shortened to slush over the years. But I, I really liked the visual design of Sir Slush. I loved Evil Snowmen. And I, that's weird because I wasn't, like, I'm, I'm more um, drawn to tropical environments uh, than I am uh, snow worlds. But I really like Sir Slush, and I got online in uh, the summer of 98, um, full time, so Sir Slush 2 at AOL.com it was. But um, I really wanted Sir Slushes to appear, so it didn't even hit me that Chinkers appeared in the form of George and Mildred, which I didn't really get to appreciate until after the fact. And then speaking of ukulele, we get a plausible origin point for them with the googly eyes, because the googly eyes. Um, Kind of, kind of form an explanation for how there can be so many anthropomorphic creatures in the DKU. Well, it's it's the googly eyes attached to things, including ice cubes in Glitter Glaze Glacier, and then we we see basically the exact same form of baddie created uh, therein. So you kill Mildred, 
But you do some good in that you bring back to life, or rather, you get Mumbo to bring back to life numerous characters, including Alf, the gray alien that you met in Jolly Roger's Lagoon. Uh, I, I love that they reappear here, and that they haven't left Earth yet because their kids are missing. And then Alf, uh, they're, they're flying over the ice side of Hailfire Peaks, and Alf, that's A-L-P-H, by the way, not Alf, the furry cat eater of 1980s pop culture. Both uh, aliens. Alf fa- Both aliens. Um, but uh, um, Alf falls out of the uh, spaceship and <laughs> dies. <laughs> this is, this is, this is Apparently this not realizing he's de- dead at first, which is my favorite part of the, the bit. Right, that yeah, there, there, and I like that. There's just this difference in biology between these aliens and what we know uh, on Earth. That yeah, it takes them a, a second to actually properly die. But uh, Alf dies, and um, Mumbo apparently has a revival spell, uh, a resurrection spell, which seems to me it, it raises some questions about bottles like why can't banjo just taxi pack his corpse in spiral mountain and and bring it to where I, there's a mumbo pad i think it might be like a like a princess bride only mostly dead scenario because <laughs> alf is dead or dying and uh the other character he'll rev- he can revive the other non-alien character he can revive is frozen solid. Um, Bottles is not only dead, but his um, cor- his corpse is fried. Um, which granted, and it's, it's still fried beaten. when he gets back up and getting maggot eaten. Yes. Yeah, it, it's already beaten, um, beaten, devoured by organisms. So. And his ghost has f- de- his soul has departed his body. <laughs> So I think there it might be just a varying degrees. And also, I think by this late in the game, Banjo and Kazooie may have just lost the pro- plot thread of what they were doing. I think Ruddy Industries probably I feel like that would be in character for them. Broke me. Yeah. I, I, yeah. At this point, they're, they're, they're just, they've just gone cross-eyed after Ruddy Industries, and they're just like, what's happened? What are we doing? They're, they're just going through the motions at this point. They don't even know what they're fighting for. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that that is probably the simplest explanation, and it's honestly probably a chat they had internally as well, because I can't imagine, like, giving Mumbo a resurrection spell that is used twice in this world. Uh, I can't imagine that was implemented without bottles ever coming up, and it's like, no, well, it's because these characters are preserved in the ice. So they've died, but they haven't, like, brain death hasn't completely occurred. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, yeah, you know, if you brought in a, a medical team, uh, like, with enough equipment and and training, they could plausibly revive Alf and the other character. Whereas Bottles, you're right, Bottles was dead, dead, dead. Nothing that medical science or magical science uh, could have done um, would would have saved him. Uh, the only way to do it would be to use something with the heft of the B.O.B. But um. Yeah, uh, you, you, you revive Alf, and then you have to find the, the alien kids, Alphet, Bedet, Betet, and Gamet. Obviously, uh, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma is where all these names are derived from. But, um, Alphet in particular, I want to point out, I, I think it's Alphet because again, you, there's a lot of child characters in this name with ver- in this game with very similar naming schemes. So uh, I, I could handle Groggy, Soggy, and Moggy just barely, no pun intended. Uh, but then you throw in dinosaurs, you throw in aliens, and I, I'm starting to get confused. But I think it's Alphet. She is the one who has a yellow Jinjo doll, which a lot of fans take that to mean as, as as a possible hint because we saw in witchy world you know the jinjo uh w- was being uh bandied about as an alien killer alien right 
maybe this yeah. co- this hints to an extraterrestrial origin for the Jinjos. There's, there's also and a Gr- Minjo inside their UFO in Jolly Roger's um, mm-hmm. Lagoon. Yeah, and, you know, Grunny's Revenge muddles it a bit because we learn that Spiral Mountain was the Jinjo homeland. And so that's always the argument I've had against this theory, but then I thought about it more, and I was like, well, yeah, sure, it's their homeland, but what if the Jinjos originated before that? I I think it's, like, knowingly playing into the joke. It's like when, um... It's it's like when Yakko, Wacko, and Dot have to clarify that they're not dogs to people. It's like, well, we're going to tell you, we're going to play with what we're not, but we're not going to tell you what we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, 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 I know, I, it, it's pos- I like that there's this ambiguity, like, yeah, they, they might be aliens, and I feel, you know, the, the meme of the dude from Ancient Aliens, but I, I that's, what, that's what I feel like, yeah, you know, throw in some ancient alien conspiracies into banjo kazooie why not i i like that jinjos have this fleshed out backstory that gets more expansive uh throughout the games but then yeah. there's also like potentially I, 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 even more yeah i i can believe they're aliens i can believe they're just like magical sprite creatures from earth but i don't need to know yeah, and I, I don't think it ever really needs to be explained. I think they can just keep throwing things out there to kind of make you wonder. Because, you know, just like in our world, you know, there's conspiracies and there's things that are unknown. And I like a world where not everything has to be explained. And that it, like, leaves you speculating and it leaves fans arguing with each other. I think that's kind of cool. So I, I do appreciate that they uh, they went this l- little extra detail for those paying attention and um yeah so you know you you help the aliens and then they leave earth and i i really like the alien characters i i like it's just this weird choice that yeah we're gonna have aliens in banjo Tui and they're gonna be uh in a, in a down spaceship near the lost continent of atlantis or lost civilization of Atlantis, I guess, um, as presented in this game, and and then Mumbo is going to have to use his Jesus Christ spell on on their leader. Like it's just there's a very insane nonsense. There's a very satisfying distance between both their appearances too. Like by the time I got to Hellfire Peaks, I had forgotten they were in Jolly Rogers Lagoon. Yeah, I, I like that this, uh, like, expedition to Earth. And they were going to, like, destroy the Earth until Banjo-Kazooie intervened. So Banjo-Kazooie saved the planet, essentially. Um, no wonder they got into Smash Brothers eventually. If Smash Brothers is a collection of, like, the greatest champions uh, of all history, of course Banjo-Kazooie need to get there. They saved the Earth. I mean, um, Elf does threaten to, to murder them for taking so long to help but he apparently yeah, le- I mean, left his laser at home. Or <laughs> Decorum isn't really um, at the forefront of this culture, this extraterrestrial culture. But um, the other character you revive is fascinating. Um, it's, it's Saberman, and of course Saberman, as most people listening to this will be aware now, uh, Saberman was the star of the uh, Spectrum series when Rare was Ultimate Play the Game of uh, Saber Wolf. But this was, was weird and surprising because, you know, Rare, like, we knew, like, Rare had been around for a long time. But, and we, like, we eventually, like, I, I think Rare as an entity became known to a lot of gamers of this era you know, from their work with Nintendo, Donkey Kong Country onward, when they went to the Rare Wear logo and branding, and, you know, that logo became this thing you looked for on game packages, like, that's going to be a good game. Rare made that, or Rare Wear made that, as most of us called it. But um, then we would go back and play older games, either that we had in our libraries or that our friends had or maybe older siblings had, and we were like, Rare made Battletoads? Rare made RC Pro-Am? How long have they been around? And much longer than any of us knew, especially those of us outside of the UK, 
because like saber wolf wasn't a known thing to us at the time um we, we didn't have spectrums we didn't have these games and most of us were too young to have even known about it you know even if they were around and so it was kind of this shocking history lesson into exactly how old rare was that they brought back this character not just even before donkey Kong country but before they were rare um and and they revived him in a way that it felt like they were laying the groundwork to kind of utilize him much more in the era to come uh at the time we thought on the gamecube yeah, even to the point that I remember, um, like pre buyout, um, in the in the early two thousands, turning a page in like a game magazine that was covering E three and seeing a screenshot with Saberman's model from Banjo Tooie. Um, it was a, it was a work in progress of Saber Wolf from the GPA, and I was just taken aback to see it, to see this after like so soon after Banjo Tooie. Yeah, it you know Saber Man. Uh, after you revive him and and dethaw him, and you know I I like that they actually just it, it, it's similar to what they did with Pendragon in Sea of Thieves, another uh, character from this era that you know they they kind of explain what he got up to once his series ended, once the last game was released. Uh, in both cases, they essentially die. Pendragon dies. <laughs> Pendragon yeah, Sa- Saberman the says the wolf dies. chased him up the mountain. And, and he how he, he ended up on Fitchhellfire Peaks. He froze to death essentially, but was cryogenically preserved enough that he could be revived. Like brain death never set in. His soul never left his body like bottles. And um, and so Saberman is able to be saved, but. Yeah, it's just this really cool, like, playing with continuity, like, not... And it felt like this was the point, right? Like, you know, for as much as, you know, people like Chris Seaver might say, like, no, we never intended it to be a shared universe. It's clear at this point, at least with this team, they're, like, they're aware of all these connections. Like, Banjo debuted in Diddy Kong Racing, and we're going to reference Donkey Kong a whole bunch. And... You know, we're we're gonna bring back this ultimate play the game character, essentially the mascot of of this era of our studio. They were really laying the groundworks for a rare shared universe here, and um, I just bold like who who at rare like were they just throwing us out there like or was this a directive of the Stampers like no 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 have Saberman in his sleep s- mention that he's gonna be riding a dolphin. Like, what was it Chris and Tim Stamper who were like, we want to bring back Saberman on the GameCube, and we're gonna we're gonna get a team together to do this game, and because this you know at this point there wouldn't be a Saberman Stampede, it, it would still I, been Donkey Kong Racing. I mean, I'm thinking about know. this just from the perspective of like we've we've seen over the years like people who were like getting jobs at rare now are people like us who grew up with their work on banjo kazooie banjo tooie donkey kong countries and and remembering that they love those games and they want to be part of the studio that's uh wields that legacy in the days when banjo kazooie and banjo tooie were being made the people working at rare were people who played ultimate games when they came yeah. out, loved them. Yeah, it, it's it, yeah, and it, went on to work at Rare. To me, yeah, it's weird to me to think like the people who make the games that I love and who I revere as like just these geniuses who are completely simpatico with my own taste. The games they like aren't these games they made. You know, they they of course have a healthy love and respect for their babies, but it's like. The Beatles, you know, I love the Beatles, but the Beatles, they love 50s rock and roll and and rhythm and blues and Motown. And, you know, it's it's just funny that, you know, 
yeah, the people at Rare at this time, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be like playing Donkey Kong Country and, and Banjo Kazooie. They're making those games. They would look back with fondness on the earlier era, and and so it's it's always just something that's. But yeah, kind all of that. Me back all that to, to say, like about. I could totally imagine Saberman's appearance being the brainchild of somebody who played the Ultimate games, um, deciding like I really love. I really have a fondness for these games. I want to sneak this character into Banjo-Tooie as a nod to that legacy. Basically, like, what we've been trying to push for with TT and Sea of Thieves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in my defense, in my defense, uh, Andrew Preston, that is his fault, all right? He's the one who made a model yeah, TT of TT has already been in... in Sea of Thieves, just not the version of Sea of Thieves that we particularly are pushing for. Yes, it, it's... Look, had I not played a beta version of C... I can talk about this at this point because it's been leaked, it's been talked about. Had I not played a beta version of Sea of Thieves with TT the Stopwatch in it, <laughs> I wouldn't be pushing for TT and Sea of Thieves. That wouldn't be the character I'd be thinking about that should be in Sea of Thieves. But now that I saw it, and I saw how beautiful it was, Cameron, I glimpsed the divine that day and i i just want to get back to it i just want to touch and taste the the sensation of god once again tt and sea of thieves makes so much sense once you experience it <sighs> anyway where was i uh yeah Saberman. i'm um, lucky <laughs> Sa- yeah, but Saberman, like, they were definitely laying, like, even if it was just jokey at this point, like, haha, we're gonna make a Saberman game for the GameCube, this eventually became something they were angling for, at least, um, like, at f- first it, it was the Game Boy Advance, right? Because I believe Saber Wolf for the GBA was announced at E3 2001. Oh, it, it absolutely uh, was. As I said earlier, it w- appeared in gaming magazines alongside Donkey Kong Racing. Sure, um, sure. So like and Grunty's you Revenge. Know, so it was it was in the pipeline fairly early on into the 2000s. And so it then, definitely you know, predated uh, what if they would eventually have to do with Stampede. Once the buyout did occur uh, and then the Donkey Kong Racing project uh, it went by a couple different iterations that I, I like they they monkey haha around with you know maybe just swapping out some of the characters and I think like we saw concept art of like Super Monkey Carlo or something and then it but eventually became Saberman Stampede and then a, com- a completely like non racing game more of like a, a a game where Saberman goes around and traps and ensnares and trains and tames animals, which seems more problematic um, now with some distance. But, um, you know, in, in the era of Pokemon, you know, Pokemon Mania, it might have been in, viewed differently. In but. what little we saw of Stampede, it looks like they were trying to soften um, <laughs> yeah. Saberman's image as, like, a great white hunter type as much as humanly possible. Yeah. Um, and and, that's, and that's you can only still... stretch it so thin... It's. I mean, he, he's a, he's a guy in a pit helmet with a gun. It's, you do what you can. Right. Yeah, but I, 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 I still very much would love to play uh, any build of Saberman Stampede uh, because that was a game we were uh, looking forward to in DK Vine for so many years in the early buyout era. Of course, it became a running joke at E3 time, even long after we knew the game was canceled. Like, do you think Saberman Stampede will be announced at E3? And part of that is because of its lineage as Donkey Kong Racing, but also part of that is because Saberman returned to gaming in Banjo-Tooie. And while we never classified him as a DK, DKU character, uh, because he predated the DKU, um, we we still... He's, he's kind of like one of those almost DKU characters that we still have a affinity he, for. He's, he's a character who is firmly in the within the physical universe that yes. Donkey Kong Country exists in, but by the television universe rules of what DK Vine as a website covers, he doesn't really fit the requirements. Right. Like, it, it's like when... Um, Urkel would appear in another TV show 
It's like it didn't necessarily make something like Step by Step part of the Perfect Strangers Family Matters universe, but it still existed in that universe. It, it's I know it's a complicated logic train here, but um, it, it, that that's the way DK Vine is classic. Because otherwise, we'd have to discuss Mario and, and yeah, we'd, every ha- we'd have to Mario treat Mario game. the same as Saber Man, and we don't yeah. want that. Yeah. But you know, we 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 still have a great love and appreciation for the historical uh, lineage that Saberman represents. And yeah, he's a great white hunter, and that might not really fly in 2021. Um, but you know, e- e- and even in the year 2000, it was starting to get a little bit dodgy. But I think as a character himself, like he's he's pretty harmless. I mean, he, he's always been more a great white hunter visually than in practice. Exactly. Like, yeah. Like even you, you could change up. Even his... the the GBA yeah. game took great pains to soften that part of him by basically the conceit of the gameplay is you're teaming up with a bunch of animal friends essentially. Um, I think and and, could, and a you kangaroo lose... you blow up, but still. <laughs> I think you could lose the pith helmet and um, redesign him a little bit. Give him an Indiana Jones hat, maybe. I don't know. Uh, f- uh, like well, fedoras. But fedoras have a different too. connotation. <laughs> I was like, damn it, <laughs> we can't have nice things. Um, yeah, but yeah, you. I, I would like to see Saberman come back and, and be like this, this old gruff explorer type, because I still think there's a market for that. Like, I, kind of like a, a more cartoony Uncharted. You I know, think like, part of the appeal is just he's a character designed to be very out of time. Yeah, and Banjo exactly. Kazooie literally yeah. makes him a man out of time. And you know, as 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 much as people, and th- we're gonna stop talking about Saber Man here because I realize this isn't a, a character witness Saber Man, but as as much as people rag on DK Vine and me in particular for like what games we classify as DKU versus what games we don't, like oh the D- the Donkey Kong universe is just Heil Russell's and like bizarre fanon like oh ukulele he's covering that because he wants to cover it sea of thieves he's really making some logic leaps there i would love for saber wolf gba to be dku but because i adhere to rules and standards i have to say it is not dku and that breaks my heart it does it does i would i would love for saber wolf g because it feels wrong that it's not dku right but it is what it is. Yeah. And, and I, I abide by it. So the rules control me. I do not control the rules. <laughs> All right. Um, the, the bosses. And that is plural. The bosses. We got shield. I, so I love the, uh, the the very deft usage of language yeah, here. The, 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 have- the brothers William here. <laughs> We have uh, Chili Billy, and that is chili as in the the spicy, meaty dish. Uh, chili with an Billy. Eye. With an eye. And Billy is with an eye. And Chili Willy as in burr. It is chili here with a Y. Uh, chili Willy, the ice dragon. Fire and ice. Uh, yin and yang. I, I really like this... Um, this really ties together the whole concept of Hailfire Peaks for me, is that we have brothers, dragons, elemental beings that represent the physical embodiment of each yeah. side of the island. More, more than the bosses of any other world, I think I think of these guys as part and parcel with Hailfire Peaks because they're just the avatars of what the world is. Yeah, and, and I like how they're fucking nuisances until you take care of them like this this is one oh, world yeah. where you want you want to take out the boss as soon as you get there because you're going to be pissed off by them pelting their their wares at you unless you do it right so um you get you get to their fight by basically going to the highest point on the, each respective side um both of them kind of do themselves in because their nuisances flying from the sky um uh on the fire side they destroy um ruins blocking the flight path of the of the world and on the ice side um one of chili willy's um like 
ice missiles. I, I really don't know what you would... Ice projectiles um, slams into the foot of Bigafoot and uh, who was previously standing in front of some claw clamor boots that help you go up the mountainside. Yeah. Um, and they both are kind of situated at the top of each respective mountain in a pool of uh, pool of lava and a pool of ice, respectively. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, visually, like they they they're more serpentine than you would expect dragons. So like I, I'm always like fascinated by these dragons that appear in rare games because we were talking about how the dinosaurs look visually different from game to game. But you know, he, again, Diddy Kong Racing, you had Smokey the Dragon. Uh, in this game, you had um, well, I guess you had Dogadon in Donkey Kong 64, who's kind of like a dragon fly. Haha. Uh-huh. And then you you had Chili Billy uh, and Chili Willy. And, and they're more, like, long and, and snake or serpent-like. And they're... then you would have Banjo Pilot. You would have Steamy the Dragon. Uh, you'd have Kerosene in DKC2 GBA. Uh, the the Dragon Fellow in Cameo. Sorry, Chris Alcock. Uh... Ash. <laughs> Ash, okay. Uh... <laughs> I could just feel him... If, if he was listening to this, just throwing his, his headphones down and walking away in frustration. Um, but, but yeah, they, they yeah, all Ch- look visually Ch- distinct. Chili Billy and Chili Willy are very visually distinct dragon designs, um, just in general. And there's a good reason for that. And I love the reason. And it's because they're in service of a joke, um, which is that when you when you fight them... Um, you, they are only visible from the neck up because they're sitting in their respective pools of liquid that Banjo and Kazooie can't enter. Um, so they look like these, as every other boss in the game has, these humongous creatures, but even more so because they're giant dragons. And after the fight ends and they decide they've had enough of you and want to fly away, they hop out of the pool and... And these enormous dragon heads with even more enormous necks have these pitifully tiny bodies with with like with comically small wings that yeah. just take off and fly away. And yeah. I yeah, I love it. It's w- such a good visual joke. Yeah, what, one of my favorite uh, details on our holiday card this this past holiday season. Uh, Drawn by our, our friend Dustin Jackson, it was a uh, chilly willy uh, flying across the moon uh, of uh, over Hailfire Peak's icy side, and just like the, the scene of silhouette of that uh, comically proportioned body uh, really reminded me how much I enjoyed these characters. Um, but the the transformation, on the other hand, wasn't as memorable for me in Hailfire Peaks. Uh, this is probably one of the my least favorite transformations in the game, as far as just it it just it just was what it was, and that was the snowball transformation. Yeah. I wouldn't call this I, one it, unmemorable, but I would probably call it memorable for the wrong reason. Yeah, which is it's a, <laughs> no, it's that's, a very that's unwieldy fair. transformation. I, again, I, I because... could see like I, I could see like how like they stumbled upon this idea and how like it was a good idea, it, you know, f- conceptually. It's just it's it's it is unwieldy. It's just you're just banjo's a big snowball it's, that rolls and it gets bigger. It's incredibly it clever. Rolls. The problem is it's I I it doesn't translate into the most engaging maneuvering of it, which is. It's a snowball, so on the ice side, the more you move around in um, areas that have snow snow on the ground, the larger it gets and the slower it gets. Uh, Whereas if you take it to the fire side, because it's a snowball, it will constantly shrink due to the ever-present heat until it just falls apart completely. And Mm -hmm. I say it that way, uh, size is is tied directly to your health meter as well. 
So at its smallest, the snowball can only take one hit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, like it, it, again, really clever idea. It's just kind of a slog to control. And um, I think I, this I still is... like it better. I still like it better than the, um, the dynamite plunger or whatever. But Yeah, it, it's this transformation is probably the closest one to the original controls for the um, snowplow and ukulele. Um, yeah, ironic. I was that just bad, thinking that. But... Yeah, I, I was I was just thinking it's ironic that the the most miserable to control transformations uh, across the spectrum of banjo and and yuka games are the two snow world um, transformations, um, which they fixed in in ukulele with the patch. It controls much better now, uh, but the snowball uh, in banjo tui is preserved just like a. Uh, a and, dead body in Hellfire Peaks for all of time. And it, it, it's just down to conceptually what it is. I feel like it's unwieldy con- to control, but it's a way that makes sense for it to control because you're a sure. sphere rolling around. And sure. I mean, it, I, it, just, you know, it yeah. is what it is. It's conceptually just much stronger than it actually feels to control. I think the snowball just really um, kind of highlights to me how so many of Banjo Tooie's transformations just don't land as much because most of them are inanimate objects or or not other animals. Like it, it was cool in Banjo Kazooie to transform into a walrus or or a crocodile or or even a termite. Um, where Banjo Tooie, on the other hand. With the exception of, of one or two things, it, they're all just props and objects. I, and it, it does, for me, it doesn't land as much as someone who gets more of a thrill out of turning into another creature. Yeah, I'd say overall, I think of the transformations in Tui as stronger than, than the ones in Kazooie, just because I think they looked at the ones in Kazooie and kind of thought to themselves, we need to give the transformations more stuff to do. Because fundamentally, yeah. fun- fundamentally, something like the pumpkin transformation in Banjo Kazooie is it's just a small object. Sure. It doesn't have sure. any unique yeah, attacks I, or abilities other than the fact that it's very small. Um, the and termite yeah, yeah, that, that's a, that's a f- gets traction. The gator is small and can bite and go into swamp water, and the bee can fly. But um, Tui goes for a lot more specialized transformations, sometimes to its own detriment. I think. Yeah, I mean, and that's a fair point. I would say you, you can do a lot more with a lot of these transformations in Tui, where Kazooie was more just window dressing. I just say sometimes that window dressing is much more exciting in Banjo Kazooie, and and that can actually go a long way psychologically since, towards enjoying. Since, what I, since doing. I know somebody's gonna call me out for it, I did forget the walrus transformation, which does, uh, I guess, gives you the power to avoid a racist. I don't know. <laughs> or, or placate which, a racist. Which, which is, unfortunately, all too much a relevant superpower to this day. Um, fuck you, Waza. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's move on to Cloud Cuckoo Land. The, the final uh, primary world of Banjo-Tooie. And, and Cloud Cuckoo Land, I feel like it, it's just them like what should the final world be what what if we don't have an underlying theme what if it's just whatever bizarre shit we want to come up with and we hold it together through this thin premise of, of a wacky stage that's divorced from reality and we just call it cloud cuckoo land and you know i realize too in some ways it's almost rare doing a a little bit of a Mario world, not not explicitly, not, but it it seems like it's you know it's a world set in the clouds. It's a world where like logic and and physics take a holiday, and it's just it, it's just it it does seem like the kind of world where like if you did an entire world that had to be a parody of Super Mario Galaxy or something like that, this is might what you might end up with. Maybe, and you know, like, I, not I don't quite think that's the same, but 
yeah, it's it's not a one to one comparison, obviously, but it, it where where Rare and all of Rare's teams from this era, they were they were concerned a lot of the times with at least making not just like an obstacle course, right? Like vi- they wanted to make real environments that your characters interacted with and lived and breathed. And that's, I mean, to this day, like that's what sets something like Donkey Kong Country apart from Super Mario Brothers, you know, with, you know, Retro's take on the series versus like the new Super Mario And Brothers granted, games. like, as I was saying, it's not quite the same thing because Mario's individual worlds tend to have a sense of cohesion to them. Um, this, the sense of cohesion is that nothing has cohesion. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I like Cloud Cuckoo Land. It, it is a memorable world, one of, one of the most memorable of the game. Um, and I like that they're they're just like, look, th- th- this world is just going to be goofy nonsense. It's this magical floating islet over the Isle of Hags. And you get up to it through a floating purple bubble, um, and, and like logic has taken a holiday here. Deal with it. And and the fact that it just like the game kind of sets it up, or doesn't even really set it up that much, but it just kind of shunts it off to the side, or rather, it high high in the clouds. Um, yeah, it, I, it makes it work. I know that... Um, so my personal feelings on Call of Cuckoo Land, um, I know that a lot of people don't like this world in part because it's so desperate and ununified and kind of feels like a kitchen sink world um, yeah. where they just threw everything that didn't fit in the rest of the game. That in itself doesn't bother me. Um, I think... Um, I, I do think it's a much, much less strong final world than Click Clock Wood was in the first game, just because that Click Clock Wood did absolutely everything you want the final level of a game to do. Cloud Cuckoo Land, um, not only does it not really just hit that same height that Click Clock Wood did, but I do have a big issue with it, and it's the, the layout of the world, which is that it's... yeah. It's set up like a wheel with spokes, basically, um, centered around a central mountain that is your sort of hub to get to every other disparate part of it, um, unless you have the B transformation, but the B, as, as with the washing machine, can't actually do a lot of things when you have it. But mm-hmm. I don't feel like the central area does a good job of helping you navigate where you're going to end up in each respective part of the world. So I think it's very easy to get turned around and lost in it. Yeah. Cloud, even though, it, Cloud Cuckoo even though Land. it's just a simple matter of turning around and going through another door. Cloud Cuckoo Land, when compared to Click Clock Wood, obviously falls short. Click Clock Wood, I think, is it's in the running for all-time greatest worlds in the Banjo-Kazooie series. Just the, the concept is genius. The world itself is well-designed. And Cloud Cuckoo Land does feel a little bit, as you said, disparate. It, it feels, even within the logic or, or lack of logic of what the world is supposed to be, it feels kind of too too broken apart, too like, it's, wait, I, I, I have to go through this to get to there. and, and But it, and it's, I, I would say it's still not as bad as Grunny Industries. <laughs> In I, I mean, in fairness to Cloud Cuckoo Land, I do not think it is fair at all for it to have to be compared to Cloud Cuckoo Land. Because, I mean, uh, um, Click Clock Wood. Uh, the similar k sounds are tripping me up. Um, yeah, I know. I but almost it's a comparison we have to make because they're the final worlds of their respective games. But it's it's holding it to a high standard because I think Click Clock Wood is not only the strongest final world in a banjo game but also one of the strongest final worlds in any 3d platformer so you just have such a high bar to clear yeah i don't think they were ever going to hit upon an idea as expertly crafted as click clock would but you know cloud cuckoo land has a lot going for it. It, it i think the individual challenges and set pieces 
hold I, up a lot better. Yeah. It, it just, as a tapestry, it falls apart. I, a I feel like I'd agree with that. Like, I like individual areas of Cloud Cuckoo and tasks in Cloud Cuckoo Land, with the exception of one, which we'll get to. A oh, lot we're going to talk about that right away. That, that unites them. Also talking about, like, similar areas in the DKU, I, I do want to point out that Donkey Kong Island has its own cloud cuckoo land in uh, what's called Chimpanzee Clouds by the Kongs, called Secret Seclusion by the Snowmads, and was also arguably seen in Donkey Kong Barrel Blast, um, and or Donkey Kong 64 um, in Fungi Forest. Or is it Fungus Forest in Donkey Kong I always... Mix them up, Cameron, because it was one in Banjo Kazooie before it was. Uh, fun, it's Fungi then, Forest in in DK64. That's what. Okay, Fungi Forest. I because I always mix that up and um. I always feel bad about it after the fact, but yeah, Fungi Forest. It's just this floating islands floating landmass above Donkey Kong Island, and we make the case that. Between Donkey Kong Land, Donkey Kong 64, Donkey Kong Barrel Blast, and Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, they're all actually the same place. And it's mostly portrayed as a place where logic takes a holiday, goofiness abounds, and you've got things like flying fish and weird like heart patterns and all, all sorts of nonsense transpiring. But I, I like to think that this is um, a unified phenomenon that, that whatever chimpanzee clouds is above Don Kong Island, Cloud Cuckoo Land is also the same thing. So, anyway, um, Cloud Cuckoo Land is mostly remembered to this day for Canary Mary and Canary Mary's revenge from Glitter Gulch Mind, where you have to race her again, this time on a flying clockwork mouse? Uh, I don't know, maybe it's a gopher. Contraption? Oh, fuck. <laughs> I did it again! Uh, this is... On, on the N64... Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, it was different in the PAL version, right? Like, it was made easier in Europe. Am, I am I wrong? I don't know. I don't know, and I wouldn't know because I've never played that version. Um, I saw honest... Dre in a live stream. Dre might know. Um, but um, I, I, I think it, it was more... It, it was originally more challenging in the, um, the American releases of Banjo-Tooie, and, and they, they nerfed it a bit... Um, when when bringing it's, it over uh, to the rest of the world, it, it's genuinely hard for me to to know that for certain because I'm about to admit another shame here. Like I have never beaten the second round against Canary Mary in this world without some sort of cheese, like um, scraping a pen over the controller, or on the XBLA version using Rock Band drums, or <laughs> a turbo controller or just because I feel I just do not have the physical dexterity to do Canary Mary and every time somebody tells me it does not actually require that much physical dexterity you just have to tap slowly and then very very quickly so as not to upset her rubber band AI I don't believe them because I don't think I can even manage as fast as the kind of slow speed that she requires at first. I just... I have not been able to execute it s successfully. Even though I've I've known plenty of people who did, I've... Uh, when Chad played Banjo-Tooie live on stream and got it in a single try, I believe that he did it, but... Uh, yeah, I... I've never had any success trying the method of go slow and then speed up. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a hard concept to wrap your head around. Go slow and then speed up, like, I and that's how I did it. That 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 is how I did it. Um, and also, I was able to successfully pull it off. 
I wouldn't have been able to do it, I don't think, had I not had training with the first two Mario Party games at this point in time, and, and beating them 100%. And so I, I had my experience with plenty of mini games that required uh, like a frenetic tapping of a singular button on the N64 controller, and I, and I developed this this technique that I, I basically shake my my right hand, I, I cause it to tremble almost uncontrollably to the point where my index finger can then hit the button so fast that um, I, I can actually, I, I just press it just enough that it registers as me pressing a button, but I don't go, I don't press it all the way. And so I'm just trembling my hand, not even actually physically moving my finger, just letting the tremble of my hand be what causes my finger to hit the button. And that's usually enough to get me over the line. Um, and that's in the faster stage of it, not in the slower stage that people say to start with i'm basically taking notes at this point <laughs> <laughs> that that that's what i do at the finish line i i let her get ahead of me i take it slow and then i i i do my tremble i do my trembles i do my shaky shakes and and i get ahead of her and um it works it works but i i i spent a lot of time trying to figure that out i used the spoon I, re- I remember like reading online, people are like, if you use a spoon and, and you, you put your finger in the spoon and let the spoon <laughs> be what hits the N64. I don't even know how that makes any just, sense. Just the fact that You're people putting... had to come up with these solutions tells me it was not the almost solid challenge. Um, yeah, I don't even know how like something like a spoon would work logically. Like you're just putting another layer between you and the controller. Like okay, I mean, and um, I and I'm historically somebody who, when he was younger, had problems with these type of mini games in general. Like I even initially had trouble with the ones in Star Fox Adventures, but I think those are very achievable once you kind of hit on what you need to do. Um, yeah, the, these are and they not. They don't my really favorite, have any rubber the, banding to the degree that this does. This this goes beyond just reflexes, and this goes like this is almost like a presidential physical fitness test uh, for for those of you who have had to suffer the ordeal of American gym class. Um, th- th- this is basic. This this is physical exertion. Uh, this is wrecking your N64 controller. For, for one minor thing. This, is, this has nothing to do with getting good at the game, uh, like getting your reflexes honed to the point where, where you can do the challenges the game lays out. This is actually work. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's not fun. It, it's not fun. That being said, you know, once I did it, it it felt like I had basically like pulled off the moon landing. It it felt like is one of those goals in the DKU, the early DKU in particular, like unlocking TT and Diddy Kong Racing, I, can, beating Canary Mary the second time in Cloud Cuckoo Land was right up there um, with with like the have you pulled this off kind of. Um, like kind of trophy hunting um, to, to go back to Saber Man, mm-hmm. um, and also we should point out uh, Canary Mary keeps a Cheeto page up upper cooter. Should we point that out? I don't know, but um, yeah, the, 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 get more uh, gross. Kazooie uh, doesn't want to know where it's been, but there's very few answers left by that point. No, it's pre- it's pretty much implied that it's, yeah she yeah, shoved up her dot 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 yeah dot 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 and uh, <laughs> again I I want to point out for those of you who weren't around in the year 2000 this was a game published by Nintendo <laughs> Canary Mary arguably at one point was owned by Nintendo. <laughs> uh, and yet they just yeah, had ne- to get. Tiny and chunky and lanky back, so they 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 swapped hostage situation. Um, <laughs> they had to they had to give those Kongs back in exchange for never using Canary Mary in anything again. 
And I was like, oh, God, we don't want her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, next, I feel like next time I replay Tui, because I do enjoy replaying Tui, I will try to beat Canary Mary without resorting to some kind of exploit, but good grief. Yeah, just just drink a lot of caffeine before you do it, and just let those trembles come naturally. Um, there, there are other characters in Cloud... It doesn't feel like it at times when we reflect on Cloud Cuckoo Land, but there, there are other characters besides Canary Mary. Uh, Mr. Fit is the less egregious physical challenge where you have to, you have to race this fitness obsessed art is he an aardvark he's I an thought aardvark it was an, like an anteater an fuck have i know dude What's oh we're the... not doing this again are we <laughs> i think he's an aardvark yeah he, he's an aardvark he looks like he's an aardvark yeah yeah he's not an anteater um yeah mr fitz um he he's he's just like a he's kind of like a Mr. Fitness kind of uh, archetype. Where I guess the <laughs> really? joke is he's what well, he, he's he's got a dumpy body, right? Like he he's he, he's he's not like this muscular uh, Mr. Olympia kind Charles Atlas kind of uh, figure. He he's, he he definitely seems like he talks the talk more than he walks the walk. I think he's just getting started on it on his phys. He's he. He's aspiring. He's like the year two thousand one is going to be the year I get into. They shape. lean into it, I think, a lot, a lot more in nuts and bolts, where he kind of surprisingly became like a major character. Yeah, yeah. That's when we you know, we talked a little bit about Jolly Roger and the promotion Jolly Roger got after Banjo Tooie, by way of Banjo Pilots, but then in nuts and bolts becoming more of a major character. Uh, but Mr. Fit is the one I always forget about. I'm like, oh yeah, Mr. Fit was also promoted. And out of all the memorable characters of Banjo Tooie, he's not the one I would have uh, had earmarked to to come back in a major way. Yeah, I guess he's but, um, more versatile than some of the other choices in that you can put him into a variety of contexts because he's an aardvark in a jumpsuit. But also, what was an aardvark in a jumpsuit doing in Cloud Cuckoo Land? Because he, he's the only character that isn't a fucking weirdo. Like, he's weird, right? But he's not Canary Mary level of weird. He's not... Uh, and Canary Mary was just... Just flew up to Cloud Cuckoo Land. But, uh, like, the, the natives right. of Cloud Cuckoo Land are all bizarre. What's Mr. Fit I mean, doing Banjo and there? Kazooie are more normal in the context... I mean, are weirder in the context of Cloud Cuckoo Land than Mr. Fit is. I guess he just, yeah, found the bubble, and he went up there to train? I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I guess the high jump was already there. Re- <laughs> I don't know. He, <laughs> he must have gotten up there right when Banjo and Kazooie uh, unlocked it by, by doing the, the Jiggy Wiggy challenge. Um, but I, I don't know. M- Mr. Fit. Yeah, we'll, we'll have more to say about him when we do our Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts Spotlight series. Um, there are also a lot of memorable drone characters, um, like baddies, just that 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 attack you, or or characters you encounter in Cloud Cuckoo Land, and, and um, we'll, we'll want to talk about those. Um, there's the flatso baddies, which they're they're these two-dimensional creatures that attack you, and they look like I don't even know what they they look like inflatable tube men that are deflated, um, but they're they're holding there there are three types, one of them holds candy canes for some reason, one of them holds like a daisy. For some reason, and one of them holds a sausage. For some reason, they they also all make cash register noises when they pop out of the ground. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is it's just yeah it, it's it's bizarre randomness for the sake of randomness. And granted, when you have a world that's built on the notion of randomness, then I guess that. If that's allowed, but they are memorable. Like I, I def, they're like 
taffy critters. I, I don't I don't even know, how, but the fact that one of them holds a sausage is just the weirdest thing to me. Um, the sausage is the thing I remember them for, probably. <laughs> Just oh, we've also got. Why is why are they holding a sausage? What? Uh, well, I mean, why are they holding a candy cane? Why is one holding a flower? But yeah, it, it's the sausage is the weirdest choice. I feel like it was just Cloud Cuckoo Land. They were j- literally just throwing things at the wall, seeing what would stick. Uh, and it was probably late in development, and they were just like, "Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. It doesn't matter. It's Cloud Cuckoo Land." Then uh, something that has actual connections to to earlier Banjo Kazooie lore is the the eyeballless jigium plants, uh, the, the eyeball plants around Cloud Cuckoo Land. Uh, so remember the Brentilda clues in Banjo Kazooie. One of them stated one of the possible multiple choice Brentilda clues was that Gruntilda had an eyeball plant. And I didn't realize this until years later that this actually tied together with Cloud Cuckoo Land. But these are the eyeball plants that Brentilda can mention to you in your save file. That 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 blew my mind when I made that connection. So um, so Banjo Kazooie might have exactly one canonical Brentilda answer. Well, I, I think it's canonical that they exist. But it it doesn't necessarily mean it's canonical that Gruntilda had one, like on her bedside or or whatever. Oh, that's on, true. On it could just stand. be that she didn't necessarily have it by her bedside, but they do exist. Yeah, yeah. But I I, I love that something as obscure as a one-off Brentilda clue could come back in Cloud Cuckoo Land, and like that that when I, when I talk about these games having wonderful continuity like that's the kind of shit that i i pinpoint because like that either by accident or by design that is still uh, a masterful little bit uh, of like in there that something that the super fans will really like pinpoint and glom onto and hold up and celebrate um let's talk about guffo really quick um, <laughs> Guffo, the bean can, <laughs> the anthropomorphic bean can that you meet in the tr- giant trash can in Cloud Cuckoo Land. So, Guffo uh, is is a reference to flatulence. Uh, of course, he's a bean can, but uh, Guffo also has a brand, An extra strength um, so, bean so, can, apparently. Yeah, like extra strength beans, like that. That's that's not a thing, but obviously it, it's to put the idea in your head that it's going to lead to extra flatulence. But uh, so Chimps is the brand that manufactures Guffo brand beans, and so th- this is kind of a twofer here, Cameron. So Chimps, obviously, from an in-universe perspective, you can say. Oh, maybe this is like a Donkey Kong Island brand of beans, right? Like, like chimps brand. I hope like not. Kongs. <laughs> I, I don't want to think about. I don't want to think about guff beans when I see Donkey Kong's ass. <laughs> so long as I could think about that ass, I I would be fine thinking whatever whatever connotations I want to make. So long as that's in my head. But from an out of universe out of universe perspective, um, uh, I believe it is a reference to Grant Kirkhope and his own flatulence because uh, Chimpy was, I think, a nickname for Grant Kirkhope, which is where the Banjo Kazooie character got his name, much to my chagrin because he's a monkey and not a chimp. But whatever, that's what his parents named him. But uh, this this is a reference to Grant Kirkhope always farting. So there you go. He is, I so think, one of my Grant favorite. Kirk- um, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say thanks to Grant Kirkhope um, being nicknamed that. We we got lots of references to apes in the Banjo Kazooie series. So thank you, Grant Kirkhope, for having vaguely chimp-like features. I I, I don't I don't. And thanks for farting all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
I, I was going to say Guffo, I think, is one of my favorite Banjo-Kazooie ch- designs that's just googly eyes on an inanimate object because the inanimate object is garbage. Well, yeah, it, it would be a lazy design if the, the label on the can wasn't so intricate and, and f- it didn't feel like a real product. Like, for me, I, I can totally buy that this is a real can of beans that the googly eyes attached to and made this living creature. And that's that's such a sad state of affairs for the actual character Guffo, but it's just the kind of delightful nonsense that I revel in. That, that's why I love this world and this, this interconnected web of games. It's just, you, you can have horrifying realities like a can of beans that comes to life in this garbage can in the sky, and that is his existence. But he makes it work for him. And He's the, living his, the best life he can live. Should we talk about the other big thing in the garbage can? Yeah, we can talk about it. Um, that's what I wanted to lead into. So there's a bunch of just fun little visual stuff in the garbage can guffos in in general like um the jolly's juice um which i think was was it dud beer originally and they changed it but uh now it's oh, a reference yeah. to jolly roger did like what was that in the n64 version and then they changed it for the xbla version uh or did it change pre-release it was in pre-release screenshots um they changed it before it released but i think that uh there's a texture in used in uh nuts and bolts on the on the walls of Banjo Land that uses that pre-release screenshot, so I think it might end up in there. But okay. uh, yeah, it's it's not in the N64 final version of the game or the XBLA version. Gotcha. Because I I remembered it, but I didn't remember the context in which I s- saw it. And I was like, I don't remember it being in the final game, but it it has a clear memory to me that there is a beer reference, but. Yeah, that Jolly Juice is kind of uh, almost uh, a vision of the future a little bit in, like, all of the character brandings that you would see in Grab by the Ghoulies. Um, that, that's the kind of thing that would become, like, a commonplace reference, uh, it, like, in future Rare games. Yeah, there's a, there's that. There's Snacky Fatty Chalks. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds like a very British snack food. Like that, that's the, that's just the it, kind of like nomenclature that just seems so commonplace. Whenever somebody, one one of my friends from the UK is describing like candy or snack food, and they just prattle off this name, and I'm like, what? Okay, yeah. I, I feel like it's also probably like a self dig. Like somebody probably had like snacks by their desk, and yeah, while they were working. Um, but. The big main attraction in this garbage can is a carton of Milky Milk. Mm-hmm. And on that carton is a uh, missing child, uh, which, which is... I, I, I know that's, like, what was commonplace, like, in the 80s and 90s in America, uh, but I'm surprised it made its way to the UK, at least the knowledge of it did. Yeah, I, this was a trip I'd, like, see in things all the time, but I think it had gone way out of fashion by the time I was born, but it's still just around in pop culture as a thing, the missing person on yeah, the milk I, carton. Yeah, I, I never saw it uh, in, in real life either, and maybe it was, like, a Midwestern thing, because we're both uh, East Coast babies, so we never uh, we never personally saw it. So I, But, yeah, it, it's... It's definitely a trope that I think was internationally known, and so Tootie what was on this uh, milk carton, and that is probably one of the most depressing, horrifying, unspoken things in all of Banjo Tooie, because the whole point of Banjo Kazooie was rescuing your sister, Banjo's sister, from Gruntilda the Witch, and then you're saying what? Two years later, she's just missing and nobody cares. Uh, ob- you know, it, it's it's a it's a funny little joke yeah. because Tootie isn't even it, mentioned. It, in it's a cheeky Tootie. joke about them not writing her into the story when she was so central to the first game. But 
the broader implications of the of the visual joke are pretty right. dark. I, I don't think they r- realized yet how obsessive their fans were and how much they were to read into every little thing, even the jokes, and, and use that to inform their view of the universe. So for us, this was really just like, oh my god, Tootie is missing. What happened to her? Where is she? Is Did she run away from home? Was she, like, murdered by a serial killer? Is she in a ditch somewhere? <laughs> um, and this is just one of those long-running, um, like, fan freakouts that was ultimately resolved because she resurfaced in Minecraft, uh, of all things, uh, when they added the Banjo and Rare skins to, to Minecraft, and um, and Tootie was among them, so we just fan-wanked that she ran away to the Minecraft world. And, and eventually Banjo and friends tracked her down, and reconnected with her happy and, ending uh, now she's back as one of the poor souls in the spiral mountain stage in smash ultimate <laughs> and <laughs> I, she can banjo can also visit the minecraft world uh in super smash brothers ultimate so maybe this is how she she found her way back uh thanks to the power of smash i don't i don't know <laughs> And unfortunately, anyway, the uh, mine, Minecraft world, I think, made her go feral, which is why she's rampaging through the vegetable patch for some reason. For some reason, <laughs> yes. And, and then, before we talk about the boss, uh, we, we should also talk about the other depressing aspect of Cloud Cuckoo Land and the final fate of George Ice Cube. So, George... Uh, who Mildred was looking for in Hail Fire Peaks had been blown away by a gust of wind and somehow got blown all the way up to cloud cuckoo land. And George, he's a, he's an idea man. He was a man of ideas and he, he had the notion that, hey, I should be, I think I'm right above Hail Fire Peaks. If you just give me a little push, Banjo and Kazooie, I, I will be able to land right back to my home where my wife he, he thought w- was yeah. waiting for him it, and it should and, be said uh, from cloud cuckoo land you can see the isle of hags down below in like a a texture off in the distance and it seems to exist entirely for this bit yes but it, this is also our only like vantage point of the isle of hags as like and like to see like the shape of it right the, the general shape of it so it's it's much appreciated that they they mm-hmm. set up this whole bit because not not only do we get one of the darkest moments in the entire DKU but we also get to see what the Isle of Hags looks like and it above, even so. handily establishes that like the the lobby of Hailfire Peaks is very different from any other lobby in the game in that it's i feel like you can kind of with every other level entrance in the game you can kind of posit like yeah, the actual world is just on the other side of that door. Uh, you really mm. can't with um, Hellfire Peaks. So I like that this overhead view establishes that, yeah, despite that weird entrance, the, the volcano and the ice mountain are just right next door. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's nice that they thought enough to establish that. And that's why I'm glad this whole set piece exists um not just for that but also because we get to partake in yet another manslaughter (laughs) ice slaughter of uh of a poor character who just wants to get back to his wife who at this point assuming you've killed her is already dead um (laughs) so you you push him you just give him a little push and he slides off. I, I, this is burned into my brain, Cameron. As much as areas like Granny's Revenge are all one big blur, I can see this if I shut my eyes. I, I can see every moment of this, both the I N64 can hear and his XBLA like pathetic versions. little scream as he falls too. I think it might be like a pitch shifted banjo <laughs> scream. I'm not sure. Yeah, he he falls, and you you see him fall, and then it cuts to Hailfire Peaks. But it's the lava side. He misjudged. 
and and he screams and he lands in the scalding water. I think it's the same. He tries to get. Is, he, is it the same? He sa- tries to tell you that he wants you to tell his wife he loves him, but he can't make out the words. I mean, he loves her, but he can't make yeah. out the words. And and his wife is probably already dead by this point. If if you played the game as you know linearly as you could, oh. and and so he melts in the scalding water. He cools it down a little bit, right? Um, yeah. Um, but the pool is, of water drains into the pool in uh, Jolly Roger's lagoon, but. If you try to drain it before the water is cooled down, one of the pigs will complain that it's too hot. Yeah. Yeah, so th- th- this, again, serves the interconnected nature of Banjo-Tooie, where you're in C- Cloud Cuckoo Land, influencing the environment of Hailfire Peaks that serves the benefit of Jolly Rogers Lagoon. Uh, and in this case, it is, in negotiation terms, a win-lose scenario. The pig wins, George Ice Cube loses. <laughs> I guess Banjo-Kazooie also win, because they get benefit out of it. So it's win-win-lose. I, I guess this also means the pigs are swimming in, like, ice corpse. I don't really know how the laws of this uni- <laughs> how the laws of this universe work. <laughs> If, if if we imagine chinkers are just ice cubes that uh, were, became anthropomorphic due to the attachment of the googly eyes parasites, and that if they're attached long enough, uh, the the googly eyes cease to be and they become their own independent item, uh, own, own independent like living creature, then I think it's just ice at, at the end of the day. It just melts and it's just water and there's no trace that there was ever a living creature there, which is horrifying. Now, we, we say all this about George and Mildred, but Nuts and Bolts presents at least a plausible situation where they might have reconstituted themselves or it just might be George and Mildred's sculptures. Um, it's left yeah, I... ambiguous about... I'd like to think that it's them reconstituted, but their significant redesigns are because they were kind of put together very patchwork. Yeah, I mean, they, they like, refroze, so they, they they weren't refrozen into perfect uh, ice cubes this time around. But it is, it is ambiguous about if it's actually them or if it's just... Um, tributes in their honor. Um, when, when, when you're dealing with talking ice Would this cubes, be like ice taxidermy i i don't <laughs> <laughs> i think that's the worst of both worlds either way it, it is a horrifying fate <laughs> even if it's only a temporary one for for the loving couple um all right let's talk about the boss of cloud cuckoo land who for my money is probably the best boss in the game He's certainly uh, my favorite part of Cloud Cuckoo Land. Um, might actually, yeah, be my favorite boss in the game. Uh, I know we have Mr. Patch fans in the audience, so I don't want to speak ill uh, of other bosses. But when, like, this boss, I think, is... I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's just the uh, Minjo um, philosophy amplified to boss status, right? I mean... Kind of, um, in that it's a facsimile of a friendly character um, who yeah. turns on. And you. also, also the name Minge is also in there. So it is kind of like encapsulating <laughs> everything about Tui in one. Yeah, or a lot Min- of things Min- about Minji- it. Minji Jongo, the cybernetic duplicate of Mumbo Jumbo, who attacks you. If you walk into the wrong skull, uh, which if if you do it um, the first time around and you don't know it's coming, I imagine is terrifying. Yeah. I had this bit spoiled for me long before I got the Cloud Cuckoo. Land, oh, so I, I, was I had ready it spoiled for, it. for me as well due to aforementioned strategy guide. But it was so, still yeah, it, freaky even knowing it was coming. Yeah, this is the first 
I think the fir- one of the first times that running a site like DK Vine meant that I was spoiled, like long before uh, actually getting to play it. So I, I never got to experience the terror of getting attacked by what I thought was just mumbo jumbo. Um, but uh, just, just yeah, it, it's a great set piece and it it works well with Cloud Cuckoo Land and just the uh, like bizarre nature of it It, and it's a good shock moment even if you know it's coming and Minji Jongo is unnerving like even in part even aside from the fact that he's an evil version of Mumbo Jumbo because he's a Terminator essentially yeah yeah Terminator or like Cyborg Superman where it's just like taking this taking this familiar like icon at this point and making it like half metal half machine and uh yeah it, it's just a, a great design um I, and and like i like that um it, it it's it's something that would have been harder to implement bef- without mumbo already being a playable character because like he, he basically attacks you like Mumbo attacks you. He's got the little shock stick, um, even though in this case it's it's all technology and not magic. Have you? Um, I've done this. Have you ever um, deliberately lost to Minji Jongo and then brought Mumbo into Minji Jongo's hut? He just I don't remember. He uh, so nothing. There's no like real interaction you can accomplish, but it's just you get Mumbo standing in front of a perpetually laughing Minji Jongo, and it's just oh, kind of weird. unnerving and weird. Um, but uh, another thing I wanted to touch on. I don't know necessarily if Minji Jongo is my favorite boss. I think he might be. But what is unquestionable is he gets my favorite boss fight arrangement of a song yeah. in the game. Um, yeah, that's pretty spectacular. Just this, just like, Grant Kirkwood kind of established this motif with DK64 and brings it into this game where it's a dark, twisted version of an existing song and that he accomplishes it with um, Mumbo's theme, which is this very reserved kind of happy theme in Banjo Kazooie, and very under and very like quiet and slow in Banjo Tooie. It's very uh-huh. impressive. It comes off as this really harsh, like hard foreboding song, and I really love the way it sounds. Yeah, yeah. Everything about this, including just having a boss fight in like a setting that is familiar like mumbo skull and very familiar by this point because it's the final world um it, it's just it, it's one of the the best um in my for my money again boss fights in banjo Tui, and i definitely like would love to see like more of this kind of thing like i, I would want to see like Min, uh, minji jongo come back at some point um in like another banjo kazooie game but not like have no setup for it just like you visit mumbo and then bam you get attacked and it turns out like Min- minji jongo has been posing as mumbo for the entire game or something like that and um it just just completely like not now that it's the character's been established yeah have some fun i, I do it. think it's a trick you can do more than once because it's been over a decade sure. It's been two decades, <laughs> yeah. actually. Oh, jeez. It's been it's been a decade uh, and then since finally, the XBLA the hum- version. Yes, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, you're still young, Cameron. Hold on to that. Uh, the Humba transformation, uh, on the other hand, is not surprising and is not subverting expectations because it is the transformation. I was going to say the one transformation, but I guess the washing machine was another uh, that came back from Banjo-Kazooie and also is from the final world of Banjo-Kazooie yet again. The B transformation returns in Cloud Cuckoo Land, which, uh, you know, I, I think the B transformation was a lot of people's favorite. Uh, unrestricted flight. 
and it, it made sense to bring it back in Cloud Cuckoo Land. They did add more to it this time around. You could fire stingers, uh, so you, you had more offensive capability. And But once again, you, you fought the Zubbas. The Zubbas were back, which uh, it, it, it was surprising to see them recycle uh, baddies like that. Because, you know, they didn't do a lot of that in Banjo-Tooie. Um, they, they either went with new versions or they repurposed old baddies like, like the Chinkers into... Uh, we did NPC see the Twinklies and the tw- again, but... The twinkle, but the twinkly munchers the, were used in a in a new way. The specific you know, pairing so. of they brought the bee back and the zubbas came back is surprising. Yeah, it, it is. It, it it but you know it. I don't know. It, it worked. I I like that. You know they they were like, well, let's not create new uh, wasp like antagonists when we just have these. I that's. That's one of the annoyances I have with, like, Nintendo, for example, and Donkey Kong. You know, they, they have all of these existing baddies, but they because another team did something, they're just going to create a new version of that I mean, it even of their weird office politics. It, it, it even has a fun symmetry with DKC 1 and 2, where one of the only enemies that stuck around was the Zinger. Right, exactly. And that was basically the same team, uh, by and large, so... They, they have precedent for it, so... Um, but yeah, I, I liked seeing the, you know, a Mumbo transformation come back, and it really allowed Humbug to kind of, like, show she was the better shaman, yeah. because, yeah, she can do that, but she can do it better. I, I'm convinced she's at least the better at making transformations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've never seen her revive the dead, but that's really not what we're talking about, is it? It's when it comes to just like doing these transformations, she she seems to be the more capable of the two. She also doesn't screw up occasionally like Mumbo does. I like that Mumbo, even though he's been at this since at least 1978, he's still sloppy and uh, not very precise. And honestly, you know, I'll I'll say it like. That that's generally just the way men do things. I, as a man, uh, um, I'm I'm generally just I, I I I screw up far more than the women in my life well, do. So M- Mumbo is also particularly lazy in the first game. Like he he's sleeping at all times when you go to meet him. That's true. Yeah. 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 He, he he's a lot more. Uh, proactive in, in this one and uh he has to he has to leg it quite a bit more so um i'm glad he got his I mean, rest I, in advance. I should say not all times because he does get up in uh click clock wood but at that point he still isn't doing anything for you no he, yeah he, he had to sweep those leaves out of his it's, hut so or I it's mean, too hot it's just too, too hot. hot it's too hot for magic <laughs> That's also what he would say when he would watch the Bear Babes DVD. <laughs> All right, so Cauldron Keep is is, is the final f- f- world, but not really a world. world. You think it's going to be a full world? Yeah, I know people are disappointed because they expected like a full on world, and then they get there, and it's just basically you walk around, you you, you see the you get to see the B.O.B. and and. Uh, interact with it. Um, I, I think there were grander then, ambitions of making it like a more meaty world, but I think it's okay that it isn't. Um, in terms of yeah. like I, I look at what the keep is, and I look at what we do within it, and like I can believe that's all that's inside here. And you know, honestly, like Cauldron Keep, I don't know what people would expect. It. I think it would be hard to top Grunny's Lair from the first game. Such an iconic uh, overworld that to do another version of that, but different, it would just, I think, inevitably pale in comparison. Even if it was just more of a a self-contained world, I don't think it would have touched... Because by that point, even by that point, I think Grunny's Lair was too iconic and we were too nostalgic for it to really do anything that would approach it uh, justice. So, yeah, well, might as well just have it be 
this like abbreviated thing and then get on to the end game. Um, but um, the, the end game involved another quiz uh, because you know the Runny's Furnace Fun I think went over relatively well with the fan base. And so they, they did a different version called the Tower of Tragedy. And this one wasn't so much like a big board game as it was a TV game show. Um, where you actually, Banjo and Kazooie stood behind podiums and they were competing with Blobelda and Mingella. And this is basically the only use the sisters have outside of that opening uh, intro and providing the narrative momentum needed to get Banjo Tooie's plot going. Uh, this is all the Witch Sisters do. <laughs> they they do one as thing opponents. and get murdered for it. Yeah, yeah. When we talk about Banjo Tooie being <laughs> dark, um, like this is pretty much like the most heinous we see Gruntilda in the series. Yeah, like it's implied she beats Klungo. It, um, she does abduct a child in the first game. Uh, she, you know, she forces she the Jinjos out, possibly runs over an entire Jinjo house, depending on who was driving the tank. Yeah, but it, it's one thing to be this evil character who commits evil deeds against the good and the innocents and, and those who are just trying to live their lives. But it's a whole nother level of evil, like, to not even have honor among thieves, even when those thieves are your own kin, your own sisters, who have done Without nothing... Without him, you'd still be help. under a rock? Yes, yes, yes. So, <laughs> Gruntilda... And I don't even know, like, the purpose of this. Like, she's like, okay, the rules of the Tower of Tragedy quiz is if you if you lose enough, you die. And to make it completely fair, I'm going to kill my sisters, too. This is, this is like the... the <laughs> maybe, that, maybe It's like the Futurama devil putting his name on the roulette wheel as a sign of good faith. It's just... No, you, you could just be crooked and only put it over Banjo's podium. Yeah, but, but you know, I, I don't even think it's good faith for Gruntilda. I think it's maybe this will really motivate my sisters into doing well. And, and t- so Banjo and Kazooie will lose. And, and so maybe if I if I hold death over everyone's head, literally, then uh, my, my my fellow Winky Bunions will rise to the occasion. Which spoilers? They do not. They get crushed by anvils, including Blob Elda's cat, which I really feel bad about uh, as, as a cat lover. Uh, and then that's the last you see of them. They're dead. <laughs> they just crushed under giant weights. In a game full of death, uh, they are the only deaths that have stuck. Like, even George and Mildred, you can make the case, maybe came back in Nuts and Bolts, right? No. Blob Elda and Mangella are dead, dead, dead. Period. Uh, so, so yeah, it's basically the same structure, though, um, as, as the end of Banjo-Kazooie. You, you do the quiz, you, you succeed, you... Re- uh, well, I guess they revive everybody before the quiz, Uh, no, right? they... The order of events is they they do the quiz, um, and then they kind of have the, like, call back to the first game where Grunty doesn't really know what to do after you won the quiz until Kazooie suggests, well, you could just do what you did last time and run off like a coward. And that's exactly what she does. Apparently her podium has a jet booster inside of it that she uses to launch to the top of the tower. And Which is very reminiscent of K. Rule in, in Donkey Kong 64. And uh, then you go and rescue Bottles and Jingling. Well, you rescue them. Yeah, you, you bring them back to life with the B.O.B. Which, of, of course, the question is... So, so <laughs> they sucked the energy out of King Jingling's palace and the surrounding Earth, right? So there's enough to revive Jingling and arguably Toots. Uh, or restore Toots to full health. Uh, so so he's no longer a zombie. 
But then they also squirt some life back into bottles. And, and the question is always, where did that energy come yeah, from? Yeah, because they... And, the, one and one and one is three. They made one and one... They made yeah. one and one three. Sorry, I just went for the Beatles lyric. <laughs> got to be good looking because he's so hard to see i think that um don't oh i hope youtube doesn't <laughs> block this video now uh because <laughs> that was such a spot-on cover of come together i think that um my fanon has always been and no they, they do a terrible job of explaining this and i don't think they thought it through i don't enough. think it's they like, we gotta want, get bottles i don't next. think they want you to catch it i think it's just <laughs> it is what it is <laughs> Yeah, or my, they, my or, fan or if you has catch it, they been, don't want you to think about it. My fan has always been that in in some of like there, there's like insects that that lost their life in um, around King Jingling's palace, like ants and and crickets and, and cockroaches and maybe some like microorganisms that. There was just enough juice left in the B.O.B. that they were not restored, and all their life energy went into bottles. And and maybe bottles isn't even at a hundred percent. Maybe he was just got like eighty percent, but just enough to revive him. But he's got like arthritis for the rest of his life. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it's weird uh, the way they present it too, because they revive Jingling first, and then they and then Banjo says, well. They're going to do bottles next, but they better turn the machine up on full because he's been dead a long time. And, well, yeah. the, the question is, full with full power with, with, with what? With what? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and uh, I, yeah, so, so, like you said, it is what it is. Like, it, it we, we, we can fan whack it all we want, but they clearly I, didn't think I, it through that much. I think, like, I like to think of it like they... They redistribute like Jingling's life force, but with bottles, it's like, like it, they're like kickstarting his heart basically because his his soul is still around, like floating around next to him. Like I, I don't yeah. know how the rules of life and death work in the Banjo universe, but it seems like it, it is slightly different circumstance than Jingling, who was honestly even kind of alive, just a zombie. Yeah, he was left in a state life of like in between. Yeah, he he it was he was like dead, but his soul seemed to still be inside of him. I I don't know, but um, what what I would have done in retrospect would be to uh, in the Tower of Tragedy quiz not use the anvils, have the B.O.B. pointed at all three of them, and then. When when Mangella and Blah Belda lose, have Gruntilda suck the life force out of them and yeah. just have them like disintegrate into yeah, a pile of ash or something. Exactly like how Toots was. That was my thought. Yeah. Yeah, and then their life force gets redistributed to bottles, and then Banjo Kazooie just leaves them as, as a pile of ash. Gruntilda, for some reason, doesn't think to use it on herself at that point. Right. Or yeah, so. Yeah. Or, or even that, like, they use enough... Well, if, if they have to use it, the go full blast, then that's both Blah Belda and Mingella. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, it's... It is what it is. It's it's tw it's a 20-year-old plot hole. I'm not going to sweat it. I can... I can my, my whole nature is, if there's a plot hole or a cinema sin, uh, I, I'm going to come up with a explanation in my head and it, move on. Um, I'm, I'm not it gonna bothers me it. less than the moon punch in Donkey Kong Country Returns. Whether that's because it came out when I was a kid or not, I couldn't tell you, but at least it doesn't feel like it invalidates part of the adventure getting there, even though it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So The, the moon punch is the most egregious, I think, mistake in any ending of a DKU game. Because it breaks. Yeah, you can have a cartoony game, but what you can't break it the own like rules of that game. And where this feels like an oversight or or something that it's just kind of unspoken, the moon punch was just wait, wait. If Donkey Kong is is superhuman at this point, what was this whole adventure before it? Like what? Like 
why did yeah. he go, have to go to in, such great in, in the grand scheme, like, this this part of Banjo-Tooie's ending does not make sense, but they could have not done it, and you would still feel like the journey was worth something. Because you got to yeah. take down Grunty. It doesn't feel like that, it that raises being... the question, well, why did we even bother? That being said, I have also fan wanked the Moon Punch, so it, it so it makes sense within the world of the DKU. So I'm not sweating that either. And that's been ten years since the Moon Punch, Cameron. Ten years. But it, but it's oh, okay God. because uh. Chili Willy laid another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, surprise, Doctor Who reference. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, Bottles comes back to life, and he, he, he goes to the, he, he, he goes back to his house, and there's a big party, um, for Banjo-Kazooie. Which, which they Mrs. are locked out of. Yes. Uh, M- Mrs. Uh, Bottles is all upset because Bo- uh, Bottles was late for dinner, and, and, and Bottles is like, but I was dead. And she doesn't believe him. She she thinks this is an excuse for being late for dinner. Yeah. And aforementioned this, dinner this is Royston. Dark. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So Royston, I don't, I don't even know how this happened, but I guess Bottles grabbed Royston when he was leaving Spiral Mountain after he came back to life, and he was like, oh, "I'm gonna cook. You. I'm gonna bring you to dinner." And so the dinner that was ruined is now Royston. Um, I, I, I don't know, but yeah. I, I kind of took it to be again. like, the way I read the, the scene was that she started cooking dinner well before he got back, and by the time he got there, it was burned. Ma- maybe, like Mrs. yeah, but it, it just... picked it up, picked Royston up at some point, and cooked him just during to... the adventure. And yet she didn't see, she didn't see her husband's corpse and spirit just I... across the way. Yeah, I really don't know how to read it, <laughs> but... Yeah, that's why I, yeah, I mean, I, I always took it that Bottles would have to grab Royston for any of it to make sense. But anyway, um, yeah, Royston gets cooked again. And he gets at least, I think, almost partially eaten here. Um, he, he gets, it, it's, it's a rougher there's, treatment than even... There's animation of, of Bottles, like, you cutting him up with a fork and knife, but his yeah. Royston's eyes are still blinking during all of this. Yeah, it, it's clear that Royston is still alive and still hanging on, and his next appearance would be actually Grunny's Revenge, but that's a midquel. Uh, a week after Grunny's Revenge, Grab by the Ghoulies came out, which would be Royston's next chronological appearance. And so we know from here, he he probably got thrown out with the trash in in uh, the Bottles residence. Baron von Ghoul came to the Isla Hags. On one of his expeditions, found Royston, brought him back to Cool Haven, <laughs> and that's where that's where Royston spent the next couple of years. Um, anyway, so then uh, Klungo and King Jingling come in, <laughs> and and they join the party, and this is like Klungo is full on redeemed at this point. Klungo has left behind Gruntilda, right? I- like he. he I like that he his interpretation of events is that Banjo and Kazooie saved him from Gruntilda by basically beating him until he realized there was no good reason to keep doing this. Yeah, yeah, he's he's basically like, uh, oh wow, I I have been backing the wrong horse all all these years. Uh, I I realize the error of my ways now. I am voting for impeach. I mean, I am. Uh, leaving behind Gruntilda the Witch, and I'm going to go into a career of game design. Uh, I'm going to become a game developer, um, which is is another thread that's paid off in the future, um, which which I really respect. They stuck to the joke. But um, it's, it's cool that, that, it's cool that like, the Klungo, his, his redemption arc has never gone, like, back. They've never gone back on it. We see Klungo in the GBA games, and, you know, it, it's not really, like, clear in Banjo-Pilot, like, if he's gone back to Gruntilda or not. And Grunny's Revenge, of course, is a mid-cool. Uh, but, yeah, nuts and bolts, he's, he's 
kept true to his words. Nuts and Bolts paints him as a very different sort of character, and I believe it. Like, I believe this character is just in a better mental state than he was in Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, and Granny's Revenge. Because he's... But he, he's... He's kind of, kind of, like, naive, like, doesn't seem to quite realize his, his game is a bit broken. Um, yeah. But uh, he's... He seems to be very upbeat, kind of like and like enjoying his lot in life now, kind of jovial. When, like he, he's polite to Banjo and Kazooie. Um, like he's he feel, he's a character who I believe his character development, and he's one of the characters yeah. in he, Nut. I think he's one of the only characters in Nuts and Bolts who doesn't seem like to become a little bit jaded in the time between games. If anything, his life has improved the most by far. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's a good point. He is, uh, he's got like scars from Banjo-Tooie, like physical scars, but he, he bears no emotional scars from what happened. He, he has healed he, emotionally, mentally, and, and he, he is in a better place in his life. Uh, and, and so I think Klungo is, is one of the happier uh, consequences of Banjo-Tooie. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, Ray Day Pinball in the live stream chat has brought this up. Because uh, Mrs. Bottles, by the time of Nuts and Bolts, has left Bottles. Uh, because she apparently couldn't deal with the fact that her husband died and then was reanimated. Uh, that's that's too. That, it freaked her out too much. She couldn't deal with the, I don't know, spiritual like, turmoil or body horror of it all. So she she left him behind. Ray Day says maybe he couldn't get it up anymore. Um, but I don't have a Bear Babes DVD sitting around to see if that is a reality. So, uh, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there there are still dark consequences from the events of Andrew Tui that are left unexplored until Nuts and Bolts. But um, at this point in time uh, in, in Tui, Mrs. Bottles thinks that Bottles is just feeding her a line about dying and coming back. So, as you know, you you would naturally assume if, if your spouse said, hey, I died today, but it's okay because... Then I was reborn. Deadhamsterman.com. Check it out. So we're obviously approaching four hours now. Um, so let, let's get to this final battle with Grunty. Take some calls and then wrap it up. Because um, the, 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 we, we've talked about Banjo-Tooie now for uh, something like uh, 10 to 12 hours. <laughs> And there, there's more. The Stop and Swap episode is coming up after this, so... Oh, God. Um, the, the battle with Gruntilda yet again takes place on a rooftop. Uh, but this time, she is in the Hag 1, the, the digger module uh, from the beginning of the game, the one that created all of those tunnels, the one that flattened the poor Jinjo family... She is basically fighting you in a vehicle as kind of almost a preview of Nuts and Bolts, really. Um, it's also like another thematic but, echo of what Tui has been up to this point, because the final boss is a witch inside of a tank. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I, I like the little detail, which I didn't realize as a kid, that there's a GB sticker on the back, a bumper sticker on the back of it, a Great Britain bumper sticker, <laughs> which, being being a, a kid in the U.S., I didn't, like, know how ubiquitous those were. But uh, it's just, just a weird little detail, and I think it speaks to the possibility that the Winky Bunions are British. Um, which you don't really think about, like, where they originated from, but considering the Rusty Bucket is from Twycross, and, um, you know, they, they had this whole life before coming to the Isle of Hags and, and Spiral Mountain, I think that, the, the, you know, the possibility is they are from the British Maybe Midlands. that's where her sisters have been this entire time. Maybe, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, the fight... I don't think it's as iconic as a fight uh, as 
the original Banjo Kazooie fight with Gruntilda, and that's just because I don't think you can be as iconic as fighting the Wicked Witch on her broomstick. You know, yeah, it, it's it's a um, matter of the, it, it's the a tank little... itself can't even be as visually distinct as fighting a witch on a broomstick, just because it's a tank. No, it, it's a drill tank. It's a it's a ta- it, it's it's a drill tank from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, essentially. Um, but you know, it, I I like that they paid off the Hag One, which has been built up throughout the whole yeah. game. It's one, it like even more than the Bob, you're reminded of the Hag One throughout the entire game. They kind of lose the Bob. They they kind of lose that plot immediately after you leave Jinjo Village, and it never really resurfaces. And un, you know, un, unless you go it's, back and you visit. It's King honestly Ringling. something I was surprised to see come back as the final boss, even when I maybe shouldn't have been, because it's been built up the entire game. Because through every successive hub area you've gone, the giant tank tracks have been present. Leading up right, to the right. la- going back to the lair, and it is like a satisfying payoff to see this thing that you remember from the intro suddenly be this instrument in the final battle, and you get to see all the myriad things it can do other than just knock holes in walls. It was the right call. It, it was the right decision that this should be the final boss. Um, like I said, not as iconic, but for Banjo Tooie's I mean- purposes. I couldn't imagine any I say other it's not as fight. iconic as Gruntilda flying around in her broom. It's still a very, like, I like the Hag 1 in itself as, as a device and as a fight. Like, I think it is very cool. Yeah. And the fight absolutely. just kind of accentuates oh. how nifty it is as a, as a machine. And I really dig it. <laughs> and, and I like that it shows, like, Grunty using um, more technology this time around rather than magic. It's um, it's fun how she's kind of learning how it works mid-fight, because, of course, her sisters are dead and can't teach her how to use it. Right, yeah. Like, maybe you shouldn't have killed your sisters, you idiot. Like, m- maybe maybe this boss fight would have gone different had she spared them. But, you know, she's not at that great of a strategic planner, Gruntilda. Uh, and, you know, the, the boss fight ends with her... Essentially, her whole body getting destroyed, leaving only her skull. Um, which, again, is something that uh, it, it, the series has never really gone backseas on. Um, Banjo Pilots and Super Smash Brothers Ultimate notwithstanding, where they felt she had to be in her most iconic form, which is that of the, the Wicked Witch with the green yeah, skin. Yeah, and, and if you have but, to pick one, like, that's the one to go with. But you know, there, there, there's all manners of explaining that from it's it's a time displaced Grunty from 1998, or it's a hard light hologram around her skull. Uh, the the entirety of but, the Spiral Mountain stage is deliberately um, set to look like the location did circa the first game. So I kind of I can kind of imagine it all, being like the, time shifted to that part to that uh, moment in time. Um, Although Banjo's house is more uh, nuts and bolts. It is, though it is, I can uh, kind N64. of, like, tell myself, like, that's how Banjo's house looked through the lens of modern hardware. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but, anyway, It's yeah, not particularly yeah, Grunt, important. <laughs> Smash it's, Brothers not, can, it's not particularly Smash important. Smash Brothers can rewrite reality as it needs. It's not particularly important to the tail end of our uh, half a day banjo tooie discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so when when Gruntilda's skull is 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 she's she's just a, a skull with with fleshy eyes still in it, but like she's been reduced to nothing. And then the whole uh, kickball through line, because we didn't even talk about how kickball came back in Hailfire Peaks. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's mentioned, you know, early in the game in Junjo Village and then Mayhem Temple and then Hailfire Peaks. It, it seems to be the number then, one sport on the Isle of Hags. It, with, yeah, it does. With yeah. moles, gingers, and, and stonies. Yeah, and then so the game ends with the characters having a pickup game of kickball with Gruntilda's skull atop Cauldron Keep. And so it, it's. Like most of the main characters of the game, uh, Banjo, Kazooie, Mumbo, Humba, Jam Jars, 
uh, was Bottles there, or did Bottles stay behind? Uh, Bottles stayed behind. The conceit was that, um, you know how I said earlier that Banjo and Kazooie were locked out of Bottles' party until they took down Runtilda? Oh, that's right. The the conceit in the ending is that um, Mumbo, Humba, and Jam Jars were also not at the party, and only were going to only went after Grunty was defeated. And by that point, the party was over, everybody was tired, and Klungo had eaten all the food. Minus Royston. Royston made it out okay. Um, but the Fisher yeah, friends. Yeah, so I, I like... <laughs> so yeah, I like that the, like the characters who actually contributed to, to the plot, to... Um, you know, to, to actually, like, overthrowing Grunty, Grunty and her sisters. Uh, they got locked out of their own party, so they, they had to resort to having their own fun by kicking around her head atop Cauldron There's, Keep. I and love then, this, the unique touch in the, the kick-around scene that they're kind of basically playing hacky sack with her head, and yeah. each character is keeping her head up in a different way. Um... Like, uh, Humba is spinning it around like a Harlem Globetrotter with a basketball. Um, uh, Jam Jars is bopping her head over and over like a seal. <laughs> and, uh, and it, once again, it, it's the final payoff to the eye gag that they've been repeating all game. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the eye pops out yet again. And, um,. Then Grunty says, uh, in kind of a repeat uh, of the original game, uh, promises that, you know, just you wait until Banjo 3E, which I'm sure, I am sure they regret that lie now. Even if it was just intended as a joke, um, that, that, that has come back to haunt them. Because, yeah, fans never forgave them for not giving us a, a full-on Banjo 3E. And, and, I mean, I'm not including us in that, uh, in, in that accusation, but, um, you know, you see the general it, it, internet. It does, it uh, does ignore that there. that is an incredibly unmarketable title. Oh, like, yeah. I'm shocked, it, it, I'm like, shocked in hindsight 2E even flew. Yeah, Banjo 2E barely holds together as a pun and and banjo 3e is <laughs> just yeah it, that that just garbage like no like every marketing firm in in the world would say you can't call it that um and and obviously uh, you know when we get another banjo kazooie game i would be shocked if it was called banjo 3e because one that's that's yeah. doing a disservice to nuts and bolts I... and and two it, it would probably just be called Banjo Kazooie if we're looking at Battletoads and Perfect like, Dark and Killer Instinct and their. I could see revivals. like Banjo Kazooie colon subtitle or something like along yeah. those lines, but I think the most you'll ever see of the Banjo 3E name is like a cheeky reference inside of a game not named Banjo 3E. Right, right. And you might even have an in universe reason why. It's that, not I called mean, Banjo 3E, but... W- contentious as it is, Nuts and Bolts is Banjo 3E. In all but name. Yeah, I, I can... I, yeah, I can I can see, like, arguing the case that it is a full Banjo-Kazooie game, but it is not Banjo 3E because it's so different. But, you know, it's It's, it's an unfortunate point. It, it's, aspect where I think that... The game not literally being called Banjo 3E has kind of caused people to lord that over their heads when... Really, if anything, it should be asking for Banjo Fori. I, I I think some people can make the case that it's like nuts and bolts, a Banjo Kazooie story, like like your your side Star Wars movies. But you know, it it, it it drives the plot forward at the very least as a full main entry of the series. Yeah, so. I think you can argue it's not a traditional Banjo sequel, but in terms of it's the third main banjo game, even if it goes off the beaten path. It's not. It does not frame itself as a spin-off. Absolutely. And then uh, also we should point out that as the the camera like pans up and and leaves the characters, we see Captain Blubber yet again. This time, uh, partnered with the Saucer of Peril, and and he's 
just like again mirroring the end of Banjo Kazooie where he was on a wave racer. Now he's he's evolved to space age theme park technology, and uh, it, it's implied <laughs> that this is this is going to be his new avenue in life is flying saucer tech. <laughs> and, and, and it'll last off. him another eight years. Yeah, until he crashes it. Um, so anyway, yeah, that that is uh, Banjo Tooie uh, in in an eggshell. Um, <laughs> Ray Ray Day in the in the live stream says Showdown Town is Banjo Three, but the rest of Nuts and Bolts isn't Banjo Three. Again, it, it's semantics. I would say it is the third main entry of the series, whether or not like. Obviously, when we get another Banjo Kazooie game, they're going to hew to something more traditional, and, and we can make the argument then whether that is Banjo Three E or whether it really is. I guess the core of what I'm saying is the name is entirely semantic in the argument. Really, um, I get what people are asking for. The branding of it is a little bit odd. It, it would be like saying Super Mario World, is it the fourth Super Mario Brothers game? And then having a big argument about that. Um, but, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> what, what could be more, what could be more invigorating than another conversation about Banjo 3? Right. <laughs> Ray Day also says, Blubber says, I'm gonna win me a flying machine when he tells you he's going to trivia night. Right. That, that is the setup for it. Um, uh, although I don't know how he won the Saucer of Peril, it seems like he probably just stole it. Man, Grunty should have got him <laughs> on the Tower of Tragedy. Right, if he's if he's excelling at Trivia Night that much. All right, so we have calls. Uh, we we have three callers, four calls. So uh, let's go ahead and take the first one, which hey is from Ray Day. Here you go. Hey, conversation, it's Ray Day Pinball here again, calling into a Banjo Tooie episode. And I might have touched on this the last time I called in, but I figured I'd touch on it again because it's just that awesome, the, this aspect of Banjo Tooie of replayability and how every time I play that game, I'm, I'm finding something, a new way to play the same thing, or I'm just realizing, you know, oh, maybe this time I'll do it this way. Uh, you know, examples such as the clockwork shot, like certain jiggies, you can glide to them or you can shoot a clockwork to them. There's multiple, you know, ways to do it. Uh, you know, you can fight the woo fac fac as a submarine or as banjo. And, you know, the first time you're playing the game, you might fight him as banjo, but then the next time you play it, you think, wait a minute, there's a submarine this level. What if I took it into David Jones' locker? Like, just those little things are so cool. And one thing that I found out recently from watching a speed run is you can actually race Mr. Fit as a bee. That one, that one blew my mind. I, I did not even know that. So as I said, I just constantly loved playing this game over and over to this day. It's so amazing. Do you think a lot of those are intentional designs by Rare where you can do things in multiple ways? Or do you think a lot of them just sort of happened? Like they didn't expect the clockwork egg to be so powerful or they, you know, they oversaw a certain thing. Um, and if it was intentional, do you think it was to make up for Donkey Kong 64? Because I feel like if they would have done what they did in Tui and Donkey Kong 64, where, you know, you could get the things with different Kongs using their different abilities, but it might be easier, it might be different with one or the other, you know, that's the perfect way to design the game. And I think Ukulele did it okay, um, where you could, like, fly to things, or you could fly from to things. Um, but I think Banjo Tooie did it best, and uh, I wish every game could be like that. Um, anyway, um, that's yeah, that's about it. Do you think there was intentional design choice? And also, what's your favorite music from the game, and why is it all of them? Thanks. Bye. Well, thanks, Ray Day. And yeah, I, I was thinking about ukulele when you're uh, mentioning that. Just how ukulele feels a lot more like open as far as there are multiple pathways or avenues to collect the pages and you're not even sure what the uh implied like way you're supposed to go about it is um it, there feels like a lot of times where i'm i feel like i'm cheesing it almost and getting a page by like climbing on geometry level geometry that i'm not supposed to but a lot of that might be intentional design and i hadn't considered that it started in tui um, 
again, because Tui is so mammoth and it's such a labyrinth at times that I don't really consider like, oh, there might be multiple ways to approach this because it just feels like a game of multiple choice anyway. Com- completing the Mr. Fit race with the B is honestly a new one on me. I'd never thought to try that, and I am going to have to I try that. I have no that. idea, yeah. Um, Too bad you can't race Canary Mary as the B. Oh, if only. Uh, but I guess to the to answer the question, I I would have to imagine at least some of those alternate ways of accomplishing goals were thought of, if for no other reason than they would come up in QA testing. But mm-hmm. I think in in maybe other cases like the versatility of the clockwork eggs, it may have been a matter of even realizing some there were different ways to achieve something. Like, what's the fun in keeping a player from doing that? Yeah, yeah, like, I, I think when a game gets bigger and more complicated, like a Banjo-Tooie, stuff is going to fall through the cracks, and you might not realize it even in QA testing, and, and then it's just like, well, what's the harm in it? You're, you're absolutely like right, I, and I think that's, I think... Like, I think of something like, like sword lunging in Sea of Thieves, like, that was not an intentional part of the metagame, but they realized people loved it, so it's in there, it's a permanent game mechanic now. Right, yeah, and I think you, you also saw a lot of that design philosophy carry forward in ukulele. And you're right when when you limit players, like you you have to do it in this very rigid way. Uh, it's stifling at times, especially when a game like Donkey Kong 64, which yeah, it, we've seen from speedrunners, you can like really really cheese if you know what you're doing. But the way the game sets it out for you, you have like these very specific parameters with these five characters and you're limited. I don't think Banjo-Tooie was a response to that just because I don't think there was that much dialogue going back and forth. Like, Oh, they did that with DK 64. We need to do something different with Banjo-Tooie. I I really don't think that was the case. Um, And there was a lot of concurrent development between the two. So, um, but who's to say, like I wasn't there. Uh, I wasn't a fly on the wall. So, uh, it, it's possible, like, they, they changed some things late in development with Banjo-Tooie after seeing Donkey Kong 64, but um, I, I think that's giving DK64 a little bit too much credit in this case. I think they just knew what they wanted to do after Kazooie and what they wanted to expand on. So, um, to answer your music question, though, this, this is perfect because we were going to bring up the music before we wrap this up, because uh, we haven't really talked about it a whole lot. Um, the, the music of Banjo Tui, and partly that that's because Cameron and I are not musicians, and so to speak on it in any academic sense other than I like that track, that's a good one, that's a good music, that one, uh, we we can't really get that much into depth. But uh, Cameron, what what are your choices? Uh, favorite tracks overall? Hmm. I'm not really sure. As I said, I think really, really highly of that uh, Minji Jongo arrangement of uh, Mumbo Skull. Um, uh, Mr. Patch made it into Smash Brothers for a reason. That's a fun song. Um, I, geez, like actually, pretty much all the boss themes I really like um, because they're the ones that immediately come to mind because they are the super dynamic versions of the level compositions. Like, yeah. uh, Weldar yeah. is Grunty Industries' theme completely devoid of the understated tone it has. I, I'm i weird in that I like, um, I like Witchy World. I just love everything about Witchy World, I think. I, I like the music of Witchy World. Um, it's just kind of creepy. You know, it's, it, it's, it would be, it wouldn't be out of place on a Halloween playlist. Um, I, so I'm Jeff, if you're listening, I, I know you always make your Halloween playlist, Witchy World. I think do think Witchy it. World is probably my favorite world theme. And part of that is also just the versatility. Like every mix of it is also very good. And there are a lot of them. There's the mm-hmm. generic, like, um, carnival fun house haunt like spooky carnival fun house theme that permeates like the main area there's the space flavor of it there's the western area arrangement of it there's the creep even creepier um take on it for the infer the inferno area and just 
all of them click together in feeling like they're tied to the area they're supposed to be, even though they're using the same base composition. Right. And that's that's something Grant Kirkhope does very well, as we saw in Donkey Kong 64, you know, the DK Isles medley, the, the whole tapestry of different versions of that, you know, that that's something that he's very deft at handling. Um, I, I like Jolly Rogers Lagoon. Again, I, I'm just saying worlds I like, but I also really like the music that accompanies them. Uh, Jolly Rogers Lagoon, uh, the, the, the town. I like the nautical theme. I like, you know, the, the vaguely like seaside kind of, um, vibes to it. Uh, again, I, I'm terrible at discussing music and, and what, and how to describe it, but that's uh, th- those are my picks. I, I will um, say just on the topic it, of music, this is as is my understanding. Like Tui was in the middle of like a busy late '90s sandwich for Grant Kirkhope because he went yeah. from Banjo Kazooie to DK64 to Banjo Tui to Perfect Dark like in very rapid succession and i i can't wrap my head around how one does that without reaching a breaking point yeah and that's why it's kind of hard for me to like pinpoint banjo tui in particular just because there was so much grand kirkhope around this time and and that like honestly like by the time we hit the tui like it, it's it's hard for me to like keep track of of what Grant Kirkhope songs are in which game, uh, and that's not me sliding Grant Kirkhope. It's just yeah he he like I can't think of any other video game composer who had such a wealth of material in the span of. And two we do years. know like some material would get repurposed between games, but also like that's not a knock against him because why wouldn't you reuse a song that nobody was ever going to hear? Right. I think once we like get away from this period, that's when I like and, like w- once Grant Kirkhope had room to breathe again and we would get things like Grab by the Ghoulies and Viva Piñata, you know, and even Nuts and Bolts, I think it becomes more distinguishable in my head. But yeah, Tui is just it it feels like this whole like it it feels like the the final side of a very very large like triple or quadruple album of of his work and uh i i don't know how he did it without like breaking down and as a pool of tears all right well thank you for the call ray day and um thanks for thanks for sticking with us all four plus hours so far in a live stream it's appreciated all right so the next call is from john tessier and he called he hit the three minute time limit and then he called back for a 20 second follow-up so we're going to play both those calls back to back hello dk vine it is john tessier aka j tess express calling again uh for the banjo tui retrospective and this time we're talking about uh, the latter half of the game, Pterodactyl Land. Pterodactyl Land, what is uh, it's such a great level, but I have my problems with it. The problem is uh, it's too friggin' big. <laughs> and the other said. part of it is it, everything looks the same. Like all the stones, all the... All, all the, all the like it's impossible to navigate through the level because it all looks the same and it's hard to really find out where you are. This is usually the time in Banjo Tui where I pull out the walkthrough and I just start following the walkthrough because you know, I, I just I don't know the the maps well enough. Like in Banjo Kazooie, you spend about ten minutes in at any level, you know it off by heart. Banjo Tui, you get all ten chickies in, in some of the, the later levels and you still don't know where the hell you are. Uh, and that's it all starts with Terry Dactyl Land. I find, and then Grunty Industries, which is well known for being confusing and hard and ridiculous. Um, but the thing about these levels is they are they are big, they are hard to navigate through, but they are such great concepts for levels. Like Terry Land. that was something that should have been in the original Banjo Kazooie. Uh, Grunty Industries is such a creative idea for a level. The fact you turn into a washing machine, how could it get any better than that? The vacuum cleaner boss, or whatever he is, I don't freaking remember, but 
It, it's just so great. Same with Hail Fire Peaks. It's such a great concept for a level with the cold side and the lava side, and it's just the amazing parallels. The two bosses, uh, Chili Willy, Chili Billy, like, it's so uh, interesting, so amazing. Um, I, I, I just love love it all. Uh, but the levels are too big. That's, that's, that's what I'll have to say. Same as Cloud Cuckoo Land or Cuckoo Land or whatever. It, it, it's too big. Uh, great idea for a level, but just... Yeah, they they uh they really need to scale those things back, and and they they definitely learn from their mistakes as we as we know, but uh yeah that's that's about it. And also, my last thing here I wanted to say is that the boss is too hard at the end, grunty at the end, way too hard. I am ashamed to say I have never actually beaten it yet. Okay, like I recently like three years ago I, I replayed Banjo Tooie, and I still haven't beaten Grunty. It's, I think I did it when I was a kid. Me and my brother and my sister, we did it as a kid. But as an adult, it is too friggin' hard. And don't even get me started on Canary Mary. So my question to you guys is... I knew I was going to get cut off there. Anyway, okay, my question to you guys is, how long did it take you to beat Gruntilda, the, the ending boss in Banjo-Tooie, when you originally beat the game? How long did it take you? Uh, like, was it, like, out, like, I just want to know how long. That's my question. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thank you for the calls, John. Uh, Cameron, how long did it take? Gosh, I don't really remember because it, I was so young when I did it, but I am, I have to imagine that I, like, basically carved out an entire day to do it, or at least in so much as a day passes for a kid, so maybe, like, De- de- like probably f- f- like four hours plus or something like that at, at minimum. I don't really know. I know it took me a few tries. You know, Cameron, I know something else about Banjo Tooie that it took around four hours to do. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, no, I was gonna, I, I think that's my answer too. I distinctly remember um, getting, getting to the Hagwon fight. And I remember getting my ass stomped. And I one hour became two. Two became three. And I remember getting bleary-eyed. And I remember, like, eventually, like, my palms had sweated to the point where they stopped secreting water. And, and it was just basically, like, I had no more moisture to give. And I remember, like, feeling hopeless. This despair set in that, am I ever going to do this? And I I distinctly remember walking outside into my parents' backyard. Uh, At at this point, they had uh, a deck, right? Um, Like a a wide-ass porch that I could walk around on. And I remember walking into the backyard and just kind of getting some distance between me and the game, which I think was on pause. I think I had my N64 on pause, and and I was just, like, walking away from it. I regrouped, took a 30-minute break, came back to it, and I think it only took a couple more tries before I beat her. Um, but I, I, re- I really remember hitting that despair wall where I really questioned my own ability. Uh, can I do this? Can I actually muster the strength to beat her? Or is this a hopeless situation? Is this the game that breaks me? And Donkey Konga 2 would be the game that would eventually break me, but I, ha- I had a while to go before I hit that. Yeah, um, I I do think it's one of those gauntlet bat- boss battles where you kind of have to play it enough times that you can get through the like er- the first half of it without taking damage, like just familiarize yourself with all the timing. So that you can spare a bunch, getting hit a bunch in the later part of it when you're not as familiar and kind of everything is flying at you at once. Oh yeah, sure. And also, yeah, you you had the 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 double health, right? Like all the honeycombs are red. I don't know if I had double health when I fought her. I can't remember. Well, John, if you don't have double health, I would recommend it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it's definitely one of those things where you got to take breaks. If, if you fall into the rut of constant defeat, you're going to make more and more silly mistakes, but it's something that you will get better at, um, over time incrementally. 
um, just so long as you don't let the, um, the frustration and the anxiety build up. Um, so just just give yourself enough breathing room and rest assured you are getting better at it and you will eventually be able to muster the, the willpower and the strength to, to, to do her in. Uh, yeah, I, it's, uh, it's funny, like, um, just, just remembering back to those feelings of, like, fighting, fighting Gruntilda for the first time, or fighting K. Rule for the first time in a Donkey Kong Country game, and just, like, stuff that, that's almost second nature now, um, in a lot of cases, just how challenging it was the first time around before I had the patterns memorized before I I had a strategy in place. And uh, it's it just funny like to think back to a time when this was all relatively new. All right. Uh, one more call and then we will give our final thoughts. Well, you will give your final thoughts, Cameron. I have a whole other episode I have to get through on stop and swap with Steve, but uh, let, let's take this call first. Hello, Heil and Cameron, the guest. It is B&K, or Brittle Nipples Kevin. It is another Banjo episode, and I'm calling in because just I love Banjo. So, Fairy Dacty Land. I love the level. But I have to admit that um, after all the build-up of Two years, the TX transformation was a little bit of a letdown, but whatever, it was still fun. My question is, though, do you think Mumbo is compensating by having his whole setup on Penis Island over there? I don't know, it just feels like a... Feels like a little compensating, you know? Also, what is Grunty's deal? Like, who who moves to a new location and takes their toilet with them? I mean, it's not like it's an RV toilet. It just goes wherever you go. She literally had to whip it out of, you know, where it was and then install it into an entirely new place. Kind of sick. Anyways, that's all. I, oh, wait. Yeah, the, the final boss was uh kind of took forever. I mean, I didn't hate it, but yeah, it was. That's what it was. Anyways, love y'all. Bye. Uh, thank you, uh, B N K. Uh, which sounds like a serial killer from the 70s. Oh, the more, BNK killer. more trouble with the final boss. Um, by the way, I did want to say, I don't think Banjo-Tooie had red honeycombs, did it? I think you just got like a larger meter than you ever could in Kazooie. Oh, did you? Because I remember the okay. UI taking uh, maybe, up like a very large amount of the screen. Me, that, okay, maybe that's what I was... Yeah, I, I was confusing the two. I remember... Um, using the red honeycombs in Banjo Kazooie, and I remember seeing red with the Gruntilda fight in Banjo Tooie, which apparently has given a lot of our callers problems. Um, but um, thank you for the call, Kevin. Uh, I think, first of all, to speak to Penis Island as you call it, Pet <laughs> um, Pen Island. I think it's kind of like. <laughs> I think it's kind of like the Nazca lines. Like, Mumbo himself wouldn't have known what it looked like. Only Kazooie from the air, or, or like Terry, or, or, you know, any of the pterodactyls or pterodons in, in pterodactyl land, cloud runners, would have seen what that landmass looked like. So I think Mumbo is in a clear here. Do not disparage him for choosing that location for his skull. Do you think maybe you can get a better deal on property if it's on the shape of genitals? Asking for a friend. You know, Cameron, at, you know, we're millennials and, and millennials, we will never be homeowners. So maybe w- what we need to do is start looking for property on genitalia shaped land masses because m- maybe like that's the only way we can like 
find homes to own one day. Um, I don't know, because because you know the boomers and Gen Xers have, have have taken up all the affordable real estate on things that aren't massive cocks. What was the other question? <laughs> Um, penis islands, penis island. So, I guess uh, um, echoing a lot of uh, the same. Both of these calls are echoing like some thoughts I had on Terry Dactyland, or at least things that came up. Um, I I think the T T Rex transformation is what it is. Um, it, it's still cool, even though it doesn't do terribly much. Uh, but uh. As far as why did Grunty take the toilet with her when she moved, I don't think that was... Oh, that's it. I don't think that was, like, she absolutely had to have that toilet. I think it was she was punishing Lago for helping in, like, the most passive way Banjo and Kazooie in the first game. Um, and her idea was like, I'm going to yank you out of my opulent mansion and shove you down here yeah. in my factory where scores of my rabbit employees who were just crawling in filth will shit into you all day and clog you with the like incredibly cheap toilet paper I buy to put in this office restroom. Yeah, I, I feel like this is like the the lost verses of Billy Joel's Allentown you're you're describing. Um so I think Kevin, uh I, I don't know about you, I don't know about you, Cameron, but I find when I have to sit on a foreign alien toilet to my buttocks, it it's an uncomfortable situation all around. Um you know, we, we're creatures of habit, and sometimes we grow accustomed to certain toilets, to certain bathroom settings, which we find more relaxing and, and more conducive for certain uh, biological needs. And it, you know, sometimes if if you have to uh, perform in, in in strange environments, it it can be. Oh no! I just had the thought. Was, was Kevin even talking about Lago? Was he talking about Dingpot? Uh, no, I think it was talking about Lago. Okay, because Dingpot uh, is also yeah, Dingpot. a toilet, apparently. And she yeah, did so take Dingpot, that toilet we, we didn't, with her. We completely glossed over Dingpot when we we're talking about Cauldron Keep, but yeah. So uh, we we know she threw up in Dingpot um, at the end of Banjo Kazooie. But she also uses Dingpot as a toilet. I mean, you you throw up in toilets, or at least you can, but you can also shit in your cauldron. I... Dingpot is is the character I feel like we need to feel the most sorry for. Like Cheeto, Lago, Klungo all bear the brunt of Gruntilda's wrath, and and yeah, her sisters. But I feel like Dingpot. Like her sisters are, are just as evil as she is. Maybe not just as evil, but they're they're right up there. Where like uh the underlings who who bear the brunt. At least Cheeto and Klungo sort of like liberated themselves um in, in their own ways. Dingpot didn't yeah, really he, have that luxury. He doesn't even did get he? a happy ending in nuts and bolts. He is probably by far the character worst off in that game versus the previous game. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I feel sorry for, because Dingpot's an alright guy for being uh you know a witch's cauldron. He he he's you know he didn't ask for that situation. Justice for Dingpot. That's that's why we need another Banjo Kazooie game. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, you know we, we mentioned before Cameron uh way back. 12 hours ago or so, that, that Banjo-Tooie built on Banjo-Kazooie um, in such a way, in such a, a diverse way, that I, f I feel like Banjo-Tooie expanded so much on Banjo-Kazooie and, and took it in such 
a bold direction that it may have perpetually divided the fandom as far as what we would want from a new Banjo-Kazooie game. Because you got those who don't want it to be anything like Tui, and those who will not abide unless it follows Tui's uh, pattern, follows follows the map that Tui laid out and builds on that. And and so I wonder if there's a conundrum going forward because Banjo Tui is is incredibly divisive, but you know like the ninety jiggy question here is do we like Banjo Tui more than Banjo Kazooie? And, and for me, it's the rare case. I, I think discussing it, really hashing it out for as long as we have on these spotlights. I, you know, I, I'm pretty much back what I, th- where I thought I was at the beginning, but now it's really sort of clarified for me. Banjo Tooie is a game that I recognize is superior, so much superior to Banjo Kazooie, but at the end of the day, I still think I have more fondness for the original game. My brain says, yes, Banjo Tooie is better, but my heart belongs to Banjo Kazooie. My soul belongs to Granny's Revenge because uh, that 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 appeals to just the essence of who I am, just somebody who's obsessed with lore and continuity. And as established but, in that game, you can um, put it in a robot. You can, and you can call that robot the Hag One too. But um, I, I, yeah, it, it, it's weird. It's not like a DKC Two situation where it's like, yeah, that's clearly the better game. It's like, yeah, it's the better game. But do I really like to play it more? And it's weird that I'm even having this debate with myself, like, right? Because if I like to play another game more, is that the better game? But yeah, it is the better game. It's weird. I don't, I don't know many other franchises that have this issue with the sequel versus the original. Um, and, and where that really leaves the fan base for future games. I can almost see why they went in such a bold and weird direction that they did with nuts and bolts. Because how do you follow up Banjo Kazooie and Banjo Tooie, especially when so much time has passed? Yeah. Um. As far as like overall thoughts in the game, I feel like I kind of end up with the the opposite but kind of similar view to yours, which is I think like if I was tr- to like try to put my biases aside, which I mean this is subjective anyway, so. I suppose that's impossible. I think that the original Banjo-Kazooie is the overall much tighter game. Um, Tui has a lot more ambition. It's much bigger. But I do think Kazooie um, has overall, like, I I think Kazooie has, Tui has higher highs, especially in the script and the tone, which I prefer to Kazooie, but much, much lower lows. Um, And Kazooie is, in design, like a very tight experience from beginning to end. Um, It has a level of consistency to it, and it does have like a a very good build-up towards its climax without any sort of drop-off. So I do think, like, in terms of, like, sheer merit as... And strength as games, I do think Kazooie holds up better than Tui. But in terms of which one is my favorite, um, Kazooie, I mean, uh, Tui, I generally like more. And I think that's always going to be the case, even as I see faults of it get more pronounced. Like, um, I mean, the fact that I still say Tui is my favorite despite that one being the game with Canary Mary and it says it all. <laughs> um, it just has so much. It, it's kind of like the opposite of a death by a thousand cuts. There are a thousand little things I love in Tui that power me through the things that I don't like as much. And even the things I don't like as much, I have an appreciation for the ambition and thought behind them. Even when the execution didn't a hundred percent pan out. Um, Right. Yeah, it it's not a flawless game, and I think that's where people get hung up. It, it, it definitely is a game with problems, but the good so much outweighs the bad here that I, I feel like 
it is not like a case of Donkey Kong 64 where really just the whole thing falls apart and once you see how it's all fallen apart it's really hard to put it back together in your eyes banjo Tooie is, is so much more concrete than that it's, it has such such a solid foundation and it has so many interesting cool bits up until the very end that you definitely want to keep exploring it even if you run into that one world that you really don't like or that one jiggy challenge that breaks you and 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 withers your soul to a husk um it doesn't really matter in the in the bigger picture yeah and as far as where the where the series could go from here because as we've established every game Banjo Kazooie is kind of in the unenviable position where all three main games have different camps that say this is my favorite flavor of Banjo Kazooie. Um, to a lesser extent for Nuts and Bolts, but there are people who say hands down Nuts and Bolts is my favorite Banjo Kazooie game. Um, and because of that, there's there's not really a clear roadmap, I don't think, of where to take a sequel. And even if you were even ignoring um, the deviation of Nuts and Bolts and the controversy of whether the first or the second game is better, if you were to directly build on Banjo-Tooie, I'm not actually sure that you can because I, I kind of think it is the sequel that tries to say absolutely everything it needed to say. Um, like it uses every part of the N64 controller, essentially um, for its wow. move sets, <laughs> near, nearly every part. Just at least they got one part, part of Humba's culture. Right? <laughs> oh God. But just, <laughs> Just, just um, where do you where do you go from there without it just being reaching a, the point of obscenity? I feel like it's an unsatisfying answer, but you kind of have to find the middle ground of you know the realistic down to earth game that's completely off the wall and swarming with magic robots. Yeah. Yeah, and there are magic robots for sure. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's a conundrum. And then you've also got the fact that, you know, ukulele exists and, and ukulele, I feel like tried to walk that tight rope. And, you know, it's, it's debatable to many how well it pulled it off. I, th I think it did a very good job, especially considering it was an indie game. I, you I know? think in um, a way, but, in some ways, um, Ukulele tries to walk that type rope of um, ambition between Kazooie and Tui, but with the advantage of not being beholden to their legacy. Insofar as, yeah, I mean, obviously it was beholden to their legacy to the extent that people expected a lot from the specific developers behind it, but they weren't beholden to pre-existing rules and conventions that were established in Kazooie and Tui, which is how, say, Ukulele's final move that you acquire can just be a flight move that takes you wherever you want in the level, no, no sort of, no sort of constraint as to when you can do it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think though that Ukulele's very existence would throw another wrench into whoever develops uh, the next Banjo game, because then not only do you have to compete with the legacy of Kazooie and Tui, but you've also got Ukulele as this this factor that that very much uh, it would be compared to it. So uh, it, it's, it's probably the most unenviable task to whoever has to sort out this knot, this this uh, tangled web of of expectations and wants and desires from what's already a very split fandom. It it's such an unenviable place to be because at the end of the day, no matter what you do, you have to accept you will disappoint someone. And for more on that, tune in next time where we talk about stop and swap. In part four, -y. <laughs>
This has been a File 2 production. Terrico.